So let me let me just hello, welcome everybody. I'm sorry it's like three minutes later than we usually start, and I've got a couple of new people to admit. I need to ask if anybody can confirm with me. I sent the invitation at about six twelve, um, but earlier than usual, but no one had logged on by six twenty nine. So I resent it. Does anybody, can anybody explain, was there a difference? And I could have perhaps sent the wrong meeting ID number, but I've never done that before. Anybody? Yeah, when I tried to, when I tried to get in, it said invalid meeting ID. The, the last, the you. nine on the proper one was, an, was a zero on the original uh, email you sent. There we go. My yeah. your apologies, you guys explained the mystery. I know I was starting to think there was something else because you know they changed the login at the JC for the faculty and that caused havoc for some teachers but luckily I knew that was coming because a tech person who helped me out two weeks ago gave me a heads up and showed me how to change my password I mean I knew how to do that but uh, other other things that we had to do they changed the, the procedure for logging in for us not you guys I don't think thank you sorry about that don't think it'll happen again I will triple check before I send the next invitation a week from now so it only it costs us like three minutes or so. So sorry about that delay. Let's see. I think there's still at least does anybody else that hasn't been admitted? Yeah, uh, AT. Okay. Well, all right. So we have a lot to talk about, and the thing I think that many of you know by now, we're down to was it uh, six weeks before the final, and seven weeks before final exams week, <laughs> and uh, so before we get to that next week. We'll start with in order of uh, when they are coming up, deadlines and, and um, uh, helpful hints about your remaining two assignments, which are your second paper. It's due one week from tonight. I think everybody knows that, but in case you hadn't looked at the uh, syllabus recently. So you got a week. If you hadn't already picked a work of art, you definitely want to do that by tomorrow and start the research. And, and you can send me, if you as you could with the first one, only a few people did, but uh, you can send me a draft of, of your paper before the due date, but don't wait till the night before it's due, like 48 hours before it or, or more prior to when you submit it on the um, 14th, the day it's due. And you have till midnight that day to turn it in before it's counted late, which is only five points off. If you need the extra time, you, you have that option. As long as you keep it to under seven days late, it's only five points off. If it's more than you know seven days or more, uh, then it's 10 points off and it doesn't go up after that. <clears throat> I know that's not typical. I've been told that by other professors, some of my past students, my readers, my daughter's high school teachers are taking more and more points each week. Something's up. after a while, what's the point of doing the, the assignment? But I would urge you not to push the deadline if you can't do it on time too much past the few days, because you've got, of course, Th two more things that you would one you have to do and the other is an option one is the final obviously we need to review study for that it's not cumulative I think most people know that right but if you don't remember nothing before the midterm you need to even think about everything on the final will be from the first lecture after the midterm let me let this person in here okay uh and and so you don't want, in other words, back your back yourself up to where you've got either one or two late papers plus study for the finals from my class and your other classes. And then on top of that, you might want to use the extra credit options. No one here has done more than 20 points. I will be sending two more reminders because there's you know enough time for you to think about what, if any, of the options you want to have uh, added to your, your total. Well, that's interesting. It's a nice photo. Very nice. Where is that? Somebody sent that or it's on their screen? Just curious. Okay, well, it looks like the coast of, not Ireland, I can't tell. Maybe it's somewhere so, else. Uh, yeah, it's a background. Where is it? Uh, I don't know, I just choose the background from It's there. very nice, yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah, because my wife's a landscape painter and she's always looking for new images <laughs> to paint. Anyway, or takes her own photos of them. Okay, so let me go ahead and, and do the full because yeah, I need to show you some things on the screen, which you may or may not choose to do a screenshot or otherwise you'll see them if you want to replay this, of course, at any time before the final. It'll be on YouTube by, I'm going to say 8 p.m. because it turns out that it takes longer for some of these videos to process. 
Uh, and I have two of them, right, two different ones to do. And I try to do them both before I sit down to dinner Friday. So, so let's say by 8 p.m. on Friday, you can go back and review anything you missed if you join late or something comes up and you, and you have to leave early. But uh, if I were you, I wouldn't leave early tonight. I'll tell you why, because after the break, there is an equal, usually it's shorter and, and less slides. I don't know if you noticed that, the way I've, I've, I've arranged it. And that usually gives us a chance to end early. Well, we may end early tonight. I think the odds are 50-50 will end, well, maybe 10 minutes early, but not 20 or 30 minutes because Japanese art and Chinese art have a lot of similarities, but there's many differences and they're both going, there is going to be at least one slide on the final from both of these lectures. So what we'll do is I think we can take an earlier break. And if that's how it pans out, I don't want to rush. And if you have questions, you know, I prefer this. I'd rather you ask them as we go and in real time and verbally, if you can, because I, I usually don't want to stop in the middle and check the chats uh, during the middle of a lecture. Uh, but in any case, depending on how many questions there are, if we have an early break, we'll still, then we will end early. But the slides after the break, at least one of those, I absolutely can promise you will appear on either the slide identification the test, the final is exactly the same format, same link, same number of slides. Uh, and or another one, perhaps, or the one other Japanese slide might appear on uh, the slide ethnic part. <clears throat> okay, let me let that person in. All right, so um, since your papers are due in a week, I resent everyone. I hope you all saw that. If you didn't, you can double check your student cubby. I hate that phrase. <laughs> Sounds like grade school, doesn't it? Yeah, <clears throat> even middle school doesn't talk like that, at least not my daughter's peers. Um, and in any case, into your student portal, uh, I emailed uh, a recent, I mean, the cover, well, the cover sheet's actually numbered differently. So that actually is a good thing to download that, even if you save the first cover sheet. It goes with your paper, don't forget, please attach it if you can uh, possibly do that into the same file so it's all in one place when I or the readers start grading your paper. And of course, again, it has to be a PDF to be sure we can open it. A and B, it should have your title, you know, of your right, you know, art 1.1 second, or you could say short paper number two. Actually, I think either one. So, okay, second short paper or short paper number two, underline and last name, first name. It's the same way you, sh you should have labeled your first, and almost everyone did. And I appreciate that. It makes it much easier to keep track of them and separate them from the class, other class papers. Okay, and then of course, you also, uh, some people forgot to put a, a, an illustration. I don't know how that happened, but there's 10 points off there and there's not much I can do if you forgot it. I can't give some people an added advantage by letting you submit it a week or two weeks late when I catch that fact after your you know file has been opened and graded. <clears throat> So just double check that you included the illustration and the cover sheet, hopefully in one file, and please send it to me here at Mark W. I'm not here, at my AOL email, because that's the, the system that works best uh, for me with, it has uh, a lot less, believe it or not, less spam than uh, the, the faculty uh, portal does on, uh, <clears throat> you know, the, uh, uh, I can never remember, you know, the faculty or campus uh, email, uh, Outlook, Outlook, yeah. Outlook is fine for, for questions, communications, or even extra credit, but for papers, I do recommend that you send them, I mean, I require, sorry, you please send them to AOL. Okay, I didn't see that. I wanted to respond to that notice, but was it a question that anybody had about what we're talking about? And oh, now's yeah. the time. Yeah, please. Yeah, go. it was just really quick. Um, I just did you um happen to explain it a little bit in the last lecture because I haven't watched the um recording yet. I had to miss the last class, but about um, I got the paper, the email about it. Yeah, you're you're asking, did I explain what specifically? Uh, um, I, the architecture paper. Oh, yes. Very good timing. <laughs> yeah, you guys are you know, always helpful in keeping me focused. Uh, uh, you know, sometimes I was going to mention this, but I might have forgotten until the break uh, or at the end when some of you will not necessarily still be hanging on. I hope you will, though, because that's your last chance to ask questions about this like this. I mean, before the papers do. Here's what I decided. I consulted with some of my readers, past students and one or two other professors. And yes, my wife and daughter and, you know, uh, people that have taken art history classes. Um, and 
I thought it should be an architecture paper, but I'm not going to force you to do architecture because the point of either one of or second first or second paper is for you to choose a work of art that interests you but there is an advantage so to answer your question you can choose any type of visual art but if you choose architecture and you have any questions about researching it where to look for you know the documentation and then i said everyone i'm glad i think it's why you're asking as a heads up recent that new and i just graded this semester new handout a one page right uh, file a pdf rather about uh, how to write about architecture it's slightly different than uh, than for instance space well it's on there so i don't want to go through the whole thing you have that in your student cubbies but if you have questions specific questions like this if it's still not clear don't hesitate to email me but wait uh, don't please i mean don't wait until the night before it's due there is, I can tell you this though, it doesn't mean necessarily it applies to all students in all my classes, but it's been a general trend that students who write about architecture usually almost always get an A. And it's not a bias I have. I know it probably sounds like it because I've told you guys that's my main area of, of expertise. That's what I have my master's in is uh, and written several books on architecture. But if you choose to use one of those books, it's not going to give you an advantage. That would be totally inappropriate over anyone who uses the, any other book about non-architecture. So you, in other words, bottom line, it's your choice. You want to write a painting, a drawing, a photo, or a building. But if you write about a building, I can give you, I can't help you write it. That wouldn't be appropriate. But I can help you, point you in the right direction. And that often helps uh, students. Plus, it just expands your knowledge. And your awareness and if the art history classes you're taking this or any other have any purpose beyond the grade if you don't care about anything but the credits okay fine but most students are more you know what can i say open to new things than that so if you want to have any kind of uh you know increased awareness for future whatever it is you know travel if you're going to go travel to other parts of the world or even uh, parts of the u.s Knowing about architecture when you get there, it, it enhances and increases. I've had students send me emails from years, years ago when I, they were in my class. And then suddenly they, that one of them was in Paris when the Notre Dame started burning. <laughs> and that was a moving email. She was in tears watching the fire and they didn't know if they could save it. As you know, they did, right? Irreplaceable, whatever, you know, your, your background or knowledge of Gothic architecture. I mean, that's literally an irreplaceable human you know, resource. It's on the UNESCO World Heritage. So anyone who writes about architecture, you have that benefit, even if it doesn't necessarily immediately translate into extra high or great. But I can tell you that the students who choose the architecture papers, and if they ask for any guidance from me, just to help point them in the right direction, that kind of guidance, they almost always get an A. But you don't have to. Okay, so I hope I answered your question. Is there anything else about that? So you choose what you want to write. Uh, but definitely get in touch with me if you do choose to write a piece on architecture and you need any, uh, you know, helpful suggestions or, or uh, guidance. Okay. Thank you. It is my area. It's what I have my master's in. And I'm going to knock on wood. I hope to be able to tell you all. And if I do, I might get fired for lifting a glass of champagne on this screen while in real time, because I'll feel like it if I do. I have a book proposal about, it's called Designing Women, the West's First Female Architects. Now, I already told some of you might recall way back to the first week, I wrote a book on Julie Morgan. It's in the third printing. It's been in print 12 years. So that's that's encouraging. But it's, it's not going to be a bestseller ever. But, you know, people are buying it at Hearst Castle at the bookstore or any museum art museum bookstores usually have it. OK, so I didn't require it because this class doesn't cover, uh, you know, that period. But my uh, future classes, it is going to be required. I consulted with the Academic Senate on that. If you took our 2.3 and it's $22 on Amazon or 30 if you buy it new from the student bookstore or, or any other bookstore. Uh, anyway, the point is that the new book would be not just taking off from, I mean, she's the first woman architect in American history, the first one to uh, get a degree, a professional master's, they call it master's in architecture from any university. She had to go to Paris to do it because no American university was offering women even a chance to take a class. Isn't that ridiculous? I mean, how many women architect now? A third of all architects are women now, at least in this country, I don't know about the rest of the world. And she designed more buildings than Frank Lloyd Wright. She out, 
produced him by 200 buildings. And she had all that prejudice to overcome uh, against women being incapable of designing good buildings. She designed 750 buildings of which nearly 700 still survive and are in perfectly good use. A remarkable woman. Okay, but there were uh, half a dozen other women in her time frame who were inspired by her example and nobody except the people in those cities where they worked all over the Western US in, in actually it's seven states. Yeah, because including her, she's California based. But her work's not just in California. And these architects designed, for instance, I'll give you a quick example. If you ever go to the Grand Canyon, you're gonna see buildings by a woman architect from the early 1900s. And nobody knows that except the architecture buffs and maybe the National Park Service Rangers, some of them might know that. Um, and, and she was you know, very successful also with hotels and housing projects, including for low income. This is what we're talking about 100 plus years ago. And of course, being a woman, again, she had to overcome all kinds of prejudice. Uh, Mary Coulter was her name. Uh, she was based in Arizona. So some a book on that subject, I would think might have some relevance <laughs> for women artists and uh, people want to become, whether they're men or women or uh, they, whatever. If they want to go into architecture, I hope books like the ones that I have written and the new one, I hope will get accepted. It's sitting with a publisher in LA who's interested in it, but of course, they haven't given me an answer, right? I've told you. So that's my pitch on architecture. It's enough said because we have some architecture slides, in fact, tonight, more than usual, but they aren't about California architecture, obviously. China. Okay, before we get to that, the first topic, any questions anyone else has about extra credit, your papers, or grades? And of course, I'll stick around as I always do at the end, and as long as anyone still has more questions, if you need to. Anybody else have any other questions? All right, so let's uh, give you a very brief overview of what we're going to see. So we want to get, because I know we had a slightly later start, uh, to our first slide, which is uh, China before 1300. Well, maybe you already know this, but if you don't, you don't have to write this, but you should be aware of this. It applies to all the slides from the syllabus on China tonight. Uh, that is China is one of the oldest urban civilizations on earth. China was uh, already having, you know, cities and urban, you know, societies divided, skilled, they call it skilled labor, division of labor, that's the phrase economists use. And those people in different professions who lived in cities and, and produced, you know, a vibrant economy. That's what you mean by urban civilization. So they're one of the five oldest urban, uh, urban civilizations on earth. I think I've mentioned the others, but in case it's not obvious, India, Babylon, or some people just call it the ancient Near East or Middle East, Egypt and Mesoamerica, which I know some of you have either lived in or come here from or traveled to, right? Mexico and Central America. So we're, we're looking at, uh, in order of, of course, we covered that already, um, you know, tonight, China and then Japan. Uh, and they're very, very similar in some ways, but there are major differences. So China, you probably already know this, so we're going to get to the first slide now is also the most populous country on earth with 1.4, a little over 1.4 billion, but India is fast gaining on them. And there will be not too long from now, there will be um, you know, a day, probably the next five years or less when, when India becomes more populated than China. China has exa almost exactly the same land area that the US and it has four times the population. So that's an easy calculation. You don't have to be a math major. It means they're four times the country of China today is four times more crowded. Plus it's the second largest economy in the world and it's gaining and probably it'll grow. it's growing faster than we are. Although this year we'll probably match their growth rate but it, they've grown at twice the rate we have their economy for, for over a decade if not longer so sometime in the next 10 or 15 years they'll become the world's largest economy okay so a little bit of context now the first slide on this is really remarkable work that i'll bet a few of you have read about because it's so famous but let's now go to, there we go, maximize. And I need to make sure you guys can see this, right? You guys can see this? Yes? <laughs> yes. Oh, uh, good. It helps to have just even one confirmation. Okay. All right. So um, this first must know uh, is, <clears throat> let 
Hang on. I want to make sure I say it the way it is in Stockstead. That's how I use the titles, though some some textbooks and websites, most websites, don't exactly have the same titles in case you're doing research or making flashcards or something to study from. So here's the Stockstead title. Kin, I'll spell this, of course. Kin Dynasty Soldiers from Emperor's Tomb. Kin is Q. I and dynasty, you probably know, has a Y dynasty, D Y N S T Y. Of course, soldiers from emperors, apostrophe S, tomb, of course, is T O M B. China, obviously, the location, China, 210 BC or BCE. So, what are we looking at here? Well, we're looking at a life size army, and that is the right way to start writing about this, the meaning of this in your notes a life-size army of over 7,000 individually sculpted statues. They're made out of clay, but that doesn't matter just because they're not you know, stone. Well, obviously they've survived. We'll say, how did they survive? Yeah, usually clay is very fragile. We'll talk about that in a few minutes, but first to just start out with what this is, what you're looking at. Again, it is a uh, life-size set of over 7,000 soldiers made from clay to guard the first emperor of unified China's tomb, as the title tells you. He was known as Qin. That was the name of the dynasty he founded. Now, dynasties, most people think of them lasting a few hundred years in China. They usually did, three, four hundred years. Ancient Egypt, five hundreds, a thousand. Not this dynasty. So I'll say it again. The Qin dynasty, that's the emperor who ordered these sculptures of soldiers to guard his tomb. Of course, he ordered that before he died while he was alive. And then they were placed in front of his tomb after he died. He was the founder, I'll say it again, the Qin dynasty was the first dynasty to unify China. So most people consider the, the, you know, the Chinese empire and it was an empire, no question. They, they conquered a lot of neighboring cultures and they still occupy some, right? Like Tibet and Zhizhang, I can never say, Zhejiang or the Muslim, uh, population majority is, uh, and you know a few other places. <laughs> so they were an empire. So this, the founding of the Jap uh, Chinese Empire, sorry, was this due to this man unifying China under one emperor for the first time. Pretty important date in the history of the world, not just China. And these soldiers were were um, you know cr created to guard his tomb, but each one is unique. Let's take a closer look at them. Uh, I'm going to have some details of them, but even in this view when you you'll get closer to this you probably start to notice no two are alike that's a really important fact about them this is unique there's no other site like this around the world that i've ever read about at least that no one's ever documented these these figures are life-size wearing their uniforms and their hair you know in a top knot the way they were supposed to when they were in the military and uh, they are all uh, sculpted probably from real live soldiers who were alive at that time. In any case, no two are alike. And I'm going to prove that to you here now with a close up. Look at their faces. Uh, they have different expressions. They may look very similar, but you can see there are differences in their, in their details on their hair, uh, their, you know, overall expression, as I was saying, of course, but also the even the way their, their armor is like this guy's obviously a taller and a bit heavier than the man next to him. And uh, this man looks like he might be possibly tired, if not asleep on guard duty. Of course, they could get him <clears throat> in trouble. Anyway, the point is that they are very lifelike and amazingly detailed. These are, each one is a work of art worthy of, and museum, I would call it that, museum quality work of art, each one of these. And when you put them together, it's, it's almost mind boggling. They are unique. There is no other collection of figures, carved figures of any culture, or any, any ruler from any period of the past that, that matches this in terms of size and, and the, the amount of detail of each figure. But it's not just soldiers. In fact, that's what the uh, big point of what I try to make is not. It's not obvious in 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 Gil, uh, sorry in uh, Stockstead that these are. This is a collection of first the seven thousand soldiers, right? And then look what's behind them. All of the support of an army. An army travels on its stomach. You may know that quote from Napoleon. 
it's been true since the first armies ever marched. So there are also hundreds of horses and carts which were created. And then here are some of the support staff here. You go up close and we can see each of them has, I know these two look very much alike, but they're, they've got different expressions. And these are not soldiers, although they are probably in there, are in the Chinese army of that day, but they're support staff. They're, they're logistical, well, you could say whatever you want. They are the people that uh, brought supplies to the uh, army. Uh, and, and so it's amazingly detailed. The fact that the artist and the emperor himself ordered this, I'm sure, was, was recreating an entire army as though they were ready to go on the march. But where are they and how were they found? That's the last part of the meeting. So let's go back to the first view because if it's on the exam, this is the view you'll have. Okay, well, they were buried for thousands of years, well over 2000 years. By the way, that dynasty, I forgot to finish the point, is it only lasted two generations, the father, then the son. And then the son, when he died, the, the grandson, I guess it would have been, didn't didn't uh, succeed in taking the throne of uh, China. Another dynasty took over. So it's only a short-lived dynasty, but it's still an important one because it's the first one to unify uh, China under one emperor. Okay, so these figures are- Did, um, yes, did the ahead. previous generations pave the way to unify China or mm -hmm. were they solely- good, No, uh, good point. Yes, there, was, there were attempts to unify China. There were wars in which maybe even two thirds. I just read a book on the history of China. It's excellent. And uh, if I think of it at the break, I'll, I'll hold it up to the screen. By the way, I forgot to hold up to the screen a chart that I took quite a bit of time to hand print on how you could still get an A, even if you didn't get A and A or a B on either your first paper or your midterm. So for some people that might be encouraging. That's an exercise I usually takes like three minutes or less. I'll do that to start of the second half after the break. Okay, but to answer your question, yeah, you're right. It wasn't that there was never any attempts or even some partial unification. These were different kingdoms that fought with each other. But he's the first one that succeeded in unifying all the kingdoms at that time that were basically the same um, background. They had the same language and uh, ethnic origin. Han is the, you may know that, capital H-A-N is the majority population of China is Han. But of course now they have two different, well, dialects of, uh, they're not the same language, right? Um, Northern, Southern China, right? Mandarin and Cantonese. And I've been to China and I was only in the Cantonese area, but I met many people from the North who were visiting their relatives in the Southern parts of China. And uh, you could tell the difference in the way they spoke. It's about as much difference as there is between, say, uh, Dutch and German. You don't know what I'm talking about. Some of you, but if you ever go to Europe, you'll notice. You can almost understand them, each other. So this, in other words, to answer your question in, in a nutshell, there were attempts to unify all of the Dears and Kingdoms before this over several hundred, even maybe a thousand years before the Qin emperor and that dynasty was formed, but none of them succeeded in unity. I was just curious if he was like the most exceptional ruler, if he just swooped he, in and took credit for everyone else's work. Well, he was an exceptional ruler. That's a good question. Yeah, yes, he was. He was someone who had uh, mil well, obviously military skill, but he also was inspirational mm -hmm. because the other kingdoms didn't try to rebel once he conquered them or occupied them or had his army occupied. them. So yeah, he was both. He was, you know, he was able to, well, I don't know if you meant when you said swoop in, to conquer through military skill, right? And of course, a, an army that was well-trained. And that's what these, I'm sure these people were, it, images from his real soldiers. I, I gotta believe that. They're so distinct and individual. A mm -hmm. and B, he also was inspirational enough that people accepted his rule even when they he came into their, or his army came to their, their territory as a conqueror, you know, they didn't try to rebel. They accepted him and he was a popular emperor. Okay. And his son was, I think, but I don't know that for sure. So just say he was, yes, inspirational. And people accepted his, uh, you know, uh, unification after he conquered their <laughs> kingdoms and unified them and told them, okay, from now on, I'm boss, right? So yeah, he, he was unusual. Okay, uh, so let's let's then finish up the meaning here. Where were they when they were found? They were found in the late 70s. I actually think I know the year, but you don't have to get that. You just say 
you could even say the late 1900s, the late 20th century, but it was the late 70s, mm -hmm. 1970s. And it was during a construction project uh, for, so, I don't know what it was. Somebody told me it was a shopping center. And then I heard, no, no, it was a housing, but it doesn't matter. Just some large construction site. And they were accidentally discovered by the construction crew. First, they found maybe one or two. For instance, if anybody's seen Laura Croft, Tomb Raider, anybody? <laughs> she beheads some of these, uh, Angelina Jolie's character. I'm sorry. Of course, they didn't let her film that. <laughs> but they had to reproduce a huge percentage of these figures. That must have been an expensive set for her to go around chopping with her sword. I don't know if you ever know that movie, but I think there were two, for, right? There was a sequel. Anyway, these heads were uh, missing when they found them. They haven't been vandalized or damaged by careless excavations. As soon as those workers found this, the government of China has this law in place because there's so many historic sites in China, of course, with 5,000 years of history. So um, they, they stopped the construction project and they slowly have excavated uh, around them. They are in a shed. Here's the last fact about the main, then we'll do a form analysis. They're in a giant shed protected from rain and other weather. And they are uh, viewable only by a you know arrangement. I mean, they're not it's like open to the public. Anyone can just walk in, like in a museum, and you know pay a fee. Uh, you have to have permission to go see them. And I don't know anyone who's seen them in China. Uh, they were discovered in a part of China that today we call Central China, the Central Coast near Nanking, which is the city that the Japanese occupied and killed three hundred thousand people in World War II. You may have heard of that isn't it? Yeah, that, that city is more famous for, for World War II history, but it's also near, it's not as old as these, but that modern Chinese city or recent Chinese city is the closest big city. So it's, if you look at a map of China, uh, it's, it's right in the center of the coastline. So the central coast of, uh, slightly inland, of course, of, of China is where they had their capital, the Han Dynasty. And these soldiers were placed in front of the tomb. Now, a question no one I've heard is been as answered yet. Anyone wants extra credit? Easy five points if you find it, an article and you forward it to me. The actual article, not just the link. They write for any art history, you know, topic. Uh, but one good one would be: Well, what happened to his body? And was his tomb intact? And if so, was his body in that? I've never read that. that I think it, it. I think it disintegrated. I'm guessing they didn't find the body because no one ever talks about that. And all the research I've done, you know, because they're supposed to be in front of his tomb, and you'd think that then the tomb itself was intact if the soldiers survived like this by being buried. But maybe the tomb was not buried. Maybe it was above, you know, the level of the 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 ground at that time when it was found and maybe that means it was all deteriorated I, I don't know you don't need to know that for the exam you can just remember the facts uh remember it's only six sentences you need to write uh, uh that i've given you well more than that of course okay let's do the formal analysis if this is the view i think you can tell that these are cool they're actually a greenish gray i've seen better close-up photos of them but it, it's either way that's a cool color they are not a warm color, even if they've been worn a little bit here and there, like on this guy's sleeve. Yeah, so you could say parts of them appear to have warm tones, but that's not how they looked originally. They were a greenish gray clay color, like clay tiles that Japanese and Chinese prefer blue and green tiles. They don't use red tiles the way Western historic buildings uh, and modern Mediterranean houses do. Yeah, here in the West, meaning, you know, from Europe and the Mediterranean all the way across the Atlantic uh, in this hemisphere, uh, red clay tiles preferred tile color, but there it isn't. So these are a cool off gray or grayish color. Uh, they are life-size, so for space, it's there are two things. One, they are life size, roughly six feet tall, the average. So these soldiers were, you know, taller than most people were, uh, adult men were then. But they're all around six feet. Uh, a and B, there is a technique, and of course it's overlapping. Their clothing overlaps and their armor overlaps their bodies. Uh, and I guess you could say their hair overlaps their, their head. Uh, and then we have the rhythm, of course. The human bodies repeated with their arms, heads, they're all standing, you know, like at attention. Uh, and so they are stable. There's not much dynamic on each figure. Uh, and they're lined up, look at this, in rows that make them balanced. Each figure is balanced and the arrangement, sorry, arrangement of the entire uh, set of figures adds up to, again, uh, left to right and top to bottom. 
jawline down, you know, around the waistline. These figures have, you know, equal uh, areas above and below the waist, roughly, like most uh, intact uh, adult human bodies do. Uh, and so each figure is balanced, and the overall arrangement of them are balanced. Um, and then we have the uh, simulated texture, superb. It's uh, again, I'll just show you as a close up. Yeah, on their faces, on their armor, on their uh, hair. Uh, actually, they're wearing caps, some of them over their hair. And this, this, this guy doesn't look like he's got one on. So I guess some of the soldiers might have different hair. And then the, the simulated texture also on the horses and the carts. All the items or objects, I should say, the human figures. The horses and the carts have superb realistic simulated texture. It's all done with carved line, of course, not painted. There's no technique for modeling. These were buried underground, so there was not even sun shining on them. Uh, and then let's see, uh, mass. Well, they're, you know, I guess it's in this order. The horses are the largest mass, then the carts, and then the soldiers. There's just three main sizes there. Okay, um, I think that's any questions before we move on. All right, let's get to the next must know. We're doing pretty well on time. This is one of my favorite slides. And if you go to the Asian Art Museum for 10 points extra credit, it's a, I think it's open again, pretty sure it is. You, you have to RSVP though. You can't, like you used to just go up the front desk and buy a ticket for that day and go right in. But because they have 25% capacity, I checked the de Young is the same. I'm planning to go to the de Young to see the um, Frida Kahlo exhibit on the last day it's open, hopefully with a couple of friends that are trying to get uh, time to do that. And that's on Sunday, May 2nd. That's the last weekend that that exhibits there. But there's so much else to see at the De Young. They are at 25% capacity and they're booked ahead about three weeks. So be aware if you want to get extra credit from a museum in San Francisco, at least, you need to plan ahead. Okay, so this is the second uh, must know and it is, um, hang on, I always have to, uh, hang on. Yeah, I always have to read. Yeah, there we go. Let me close my my notebook because that's where I keep my other class records. So here we go. Um, <clears throat> Tang, T-A-N-G, Tang Dynasty Camel from Tomb. Again, Tomb is T-O-M-B. So Tang, D-A-N-T-A-N-G. Someone said, like the drink? Yes, I guess they still make Tang. Tang Dynasty Camel from Tomb, China, of course, date 750 AD or CE. Okay, why are we looking at a, a sculpture of a camel? Because it's a good example, a classic example of the high level of skill of sculptors during a very prosperous dynasty. The Tang, with the T again, Tang Dynasty was, was a golden age in Chinese history. It was a period of, this is all part of the meeting, of course, now. It was a period of stability, political and economic prosperity. So political stability, I mean, they weren't fighting with each other, these kingdoms. The Tang emperors were very popular and they helped establish uh, the government bureaucracy, which again, people you know think of that as a negative word today, I guess, but you know, try to have civilized society without a bureaucracy. It doesn't happen, it doesn't work. So they were, or urban civilization anyway. So they were trained, uh, the officials, the government would send to the local regional you know, governments were, were trained by the emperor's you know, assigned right, experts, whether it was in, you know, they had post, Postal service, mail, you know, and tax collecting, of course, but they also had services, you know, like helping the farmers and, you know, distributing food, obviously. So just say all the government services were regulated and well run. You just keep it simple like that. And that's what we mean by a well functioning bureaucracy. So they, they were popular, the Tang dynasty, and they, there wasn't any rebellions against them. Well, there might have been a few. There always are a few people on the outskirts of any empire that are going to rebel, of course. But the main population under them, most of the Chinese, the the Han, H-A-N, dominant population of China, they were very, very satisfied with and therefore happy to live under the uh, Tang Dynasty. But they also encouraged the arts. That include literature, poetry, of course, and, and, and other kinds of writing. Uh, music and sculpture. And look how 
detailed this piece is. I love this. If you go to the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco, there's a room full of these. But this is a little more refined than the ones you can see in San Francisco because they're, they're a little bit later. So let's go take a look at what we're looking at here. Well, this is a group of merchants. You might think, wait a minute, they all look like musicians. Well, they're both. These are businessmen, you could even say, traders, if you want to say, because that's sort of what they were, making a trek across China by camel. That's the way they went along the Silk Road. If you don't know what that was, you don't have to for the exam. But if you want to write it, part of the meaning, that was the route, the main route that had been around since before the uh, Qin Dynasty for thousands of years. The Romans and the Greeks under Alexander the Great, that far back, were using the Silk Route to get their goods back and forth to trade with China. So China, by the Tang Dynasty, was a prosperous, if not the most prosperous society in the world because Rome had fallen. When Rome was around, it was probably the wealthiest empire. Well, it was the wealthiest empire during its heyday. But now Rome's long gone. Europe's in the Dark Ages. So the probably most advanced society on Earth at that time was China. And they would send uh, caravans, so it wouldn't be just one camel, but you know, a whole caravan, across their deserts and mountains into where? The Middle East to trade, meaning the Arabic countries, which by then were already beginning, just beginning to convert to Islam. So they had peaceful relations with their neighbors, trade, and they became prosperous because of it. And then that meant that artists were commissioned to create really lovely works of art of all kinds, and this is one example. See, these guys here are able to entertain themselves. These are, this gonna take months to go across the whole continent of uh, Asia on the back of a camel. Yeah, it wasn't comfortable, I can tell you. I've been up close to camels. Don't like those animals. <laughs> they stink, they bite, they uh, make loud noises, they kick. Uh, yeah, be careful if you're in a country where someone offers you a ride on a camel, just make sure you, you be careful how you mount the camel because you, you can get hurt. I've seen it happen. Anyway, but these guys knew how to ride a camel, obviously. That was part of their, their whole uh, profession. And they would make these treks. I don't might be once a year, but anyway, regularly across this silk route, which traverses China and then heads up through the mountains, you know, Himalayas, but this would have to be, right? Uh, and then down into uh, what would be now Persia or Iran, same country, right? Two words for the same country, uh, Persia, uh, or and then into Turkey, and they would trade their goods. For instance, they've got what looks like, what is it? They're probably on the way home. Why do we think that, most historians? because that rug is probably what they traded their own handmade Chinese goods or spikes and silks. Silk, silks, I can't speak. Spices, I apologize, and silks were two of the main exports, of course, I think most people know that. Have been, up until recently anyway, for, for thousands of years, the Chinese were known for those high quality things they couldn't get in Western countries. They had to get them from Asia from either India or China were the two main places. So they would bring their goods, whatever they were. Sometimes they were actual handmade art crafts and things and trade them for something of value that they didn't have or have as much of. And that's probably what they're doing, they're heading home after they've already traded their own Chinese goods for probably either Turkish or Persian rug and perhaps some other items here in these little boxes, but they're entertaining themselves. That's why you see the musicians here with uh, you know, and this guy looks like he's singing, but the camel is also singing. I love that. <laughs> uh, that wouldn't be a sound. I think it would be very pleasant for days and days to hear a camel, which, like I said, I don't hear. <laughs> hear. They make that? really loud noises. Yes, please go ahead. Mm -hmm. What makes the rug indicative of the Middle East? Well, that's a guess by some historians. Uh, it actually, uh, again, excellent question. I'll tell you what, this is not the image that originally I used to have when I had my own slides that I purchased, uh, which now, of course, being as they're three dimensional, right, physical slides, I don't have anymore. So I'm going to double check. I'm glad you asked that. I think the, the one that the original image is based on, at least that Stockstead writes about, let's just double check here. Maybe they took it out. They changed the textbook quite often. No, it is this one. Yeah. Well, there was another one that showed the uh, the rug looking at is the ones in the San Francisco Asian Art Museum. Most of them do a much more clear pattern that that is the kind of thing that you can see from uh, 
you know, just say it's an educated guess. Just keep it simple. Um, th this rug looks less directly inspired by the patterns of, on my block in Berkeley, there are four just within a block on either side, two on each side of Solano Avenue, if you know North Berkeley, it's where I live, of uh, that are uh, Middle Eastern rug importers. I don't see how they support themselves. <laughs> I don't see how they can say, well, they sell one rug and it's a thousand bucks, I guess that makes the most rent. Anyway, so I, and I know that I've talked to them and they've been open throughout the pandemic, uh, which is another interesting thing. Obviously, the point I'm making is I have some knowledge of what these look like. And this looks, it, it's a good question because it does look a little less obviously Middle Eastern to me. But that is what these traders normally would have done, is what I'm saying. That's what you should have in your notes. They would have traded something made in the Middle East, such as finely woven you know, carpets that, of course, they didn't either have or didn't have as many or as good of quality or anything else. They could have, of course, traded for other goods. And that's obviously the whole point of this prosperity, or the reason I meant to say for that uh, Tang Dynasty prosperity for at least the middle class, right? Uh, the urban society uh, residents of cities in China, they were pretty prosperous because of the, the trading that their, uh, you know, um, emperors, right, whatever you want to call them, society, that culture uh, had uh, encouraged and um, there were just a lot more trade numbers at that time with other countries. And that didn't just include the Middle East. They also include Vietnam and India, right? And, and uh, Burma and, you know, other South Asian countries. So they traded with all their neighbors. And Russia, too. They traded with Russia because it's right next door, right? So um, we guess, just say it's, it's likely that it, this itself isn't one of those rugs from you know, Persia or somewhere that that is what many, if not most of the traders would end up. Yeah, I mean, for. I know that the Middle East is known for their rugs or like Persian rugs. I've heard that yes. phrase held in esteem, but I was wondering if there was something specific about the design or well, just the fact that it's a rug. I can't, I'm not that much of an expert because I've only looked at a few of them in the shops here. Uh, I didn't go into them during the pandemic because I didn't know if, <laughs> you know, whatever, you know, the, the guys behind the desks and they were by desk and they run those shops weren't wearing masks. So I didn't want to go in, but I have recently. They have since they've opened up for you know 50% capacity at least in Berkeley, in our county here. I don't know about you guys up there, but you just reopened too, didn't you? Yeah. So so this is a very very Middle Eastern looking pattern to me, but the stripes not so much, you know. So I, I honestly, it's a good question. I I can only tell you, many historians believe this would be an image that was inspired by an actual pattern, but. I can't say that. It could be just made up by the artist in their head. Someone else had a question. I think I heard a second person because we want to wrap this up and do the formal analysis and get to the next slide. Anybody else? Yeah, yeah, it's a good point you're raising. And uh, yeah, all you can say in your notes that you need to remember if this were to be on the final is it's, it's a good example of the kind of objects that these Chinese traders during the Tang Dynasty would have uh, gotten from uh, you know, the Middle East and brought back with them. You just keep it simple like that. Okay, formal analysis. Um, well, we have colors that are a mixture of cool and warm. The camel's definitely warm. And of course the faces, right? The skin, the arms, or not the arms, I meant the hands and faces of the figures are all warm uh, skin tones. But the clothing is mostly uh, cool, isn't it? At least in this, this image. Um, but the simulated texture is what I really like about these figures. Look at the expressions on their faces, the beards, uh, their fingers, the, 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 the musical instruments, and then the rug too. It's all done with carved line. Uh, and there is painting, but it's not painted line so much. It's patterns, of course, but the lines are all carved. And then we have the rhythm of the human body, of course, the heads and arms and hands and the pattern on the rug and the hair on the uh, head and neck of the camel. Uh, there is modeling from a museum light. There's no technique for modeling. Uh, if you break it down into masses, the camel's the largest, then the rug, and then I guess the standing, the tallest man, because he's you know the one you can see the most of, uh, who's standing in the middle. He would be the third largest. Uh, and then is it stable or dynamic? I think it's mostly stable, because these guys are sitting upright 
their backs, you know, their body, except for the bottom, you know, portion of their legs. But even this guy here, one of his two legs is almost at a right angle. Uh, and then you have this man standing upright. Uh, the camel, yes, it's curved a bit on his neck, that's true. But the rest of the camel's body from the legs to the top of the hump uh, is, is mostly uh, dynamic. So it's both. But I see it as a little more stable and dynamic, but that's you, that's a call you can make. For space, it is about two feet high, so smaller than life size, three-dimensional object, about two feet high, with overlapping, of course. There's no other technique. There's no diminishing size or anything. This is a three-dimensional object. The uh, clothing, of course, overlaps the human figures, and they overlap uh, the instruments they're playing, and, and of course, the rug they're sitting on, and the rug overlaps the camel. Uh, and then what are we missing here? Uh, texture, modeling, line. I think we've covered most of it here. Oh, balance. Is it balanced? I would say so, roughly, if you do a line down here. But there are people who feel, because the cab wouldn't argue with this, if you felt that the camel's neck sticks up so much that because there's not something at this end here, obviously that's of equal height. Uh, but to me, with the guy who's standing, I think of it as a roughly balanced left to right. Um, top to bottom, again, it depends on where you draw the line. So again, I give you guys some flexibility. I hope you've noticed on the gradients on your papers and on the exam on the midterm. If you see things slightly different than I might have stated in the lecture or that, you know, is in Stockstead, um, as long as you explain why, it, you'll get credit. So, but to me, it's roughly balanced left to bottom and, uh, I mean, left to right, sorry, and top to bottom. Okay, let's go on to, this is not on the syllabus, but I just wanted you to see, this is a remarkable figure. So you can just listen for it, like, let's just say three minutes or so before we get to the next bus. Now, we're still going to take our break a little early tonight. I think that's going to work out. This is one of those Buddha figures that was destroyed by the Taliban. You may know about this, right? Uh, or, or it's similar to one, I should say. I shouldn't say it is actually. Um, this one, the seated Buddha from a cave, is one of, not the, but one of the largest Buddha's figures ever carved. And of course, at this point, we have our terms, right? Remember that handout needs to be out next to your uh, laptop at all points. Uh, we did define uh, Buddhism and Hinduism last week, right? So at, at least uh, very minimal, you know, the, uh, summary of what those two, yeah, not even really can't call them religions, you know, but some people do, philosophies or, or religions, uh, what they believe and what they teach. Remember those two terms, very high probability, one or both will be on the, at least on the true false section of the uh, final. Okay, so I'm just showing this to you to show you that it was a common theme throughout Asia not just in, in Afghanistan, where it was this one, it actually wasn't the one in Afghanistan that the Taliban blew up with dynamite, but it's, it's very similar to that. And uh, of course, it's had some kind of damage here. You see that with the pock marks and the holes here. It's hard to say what that could be from. That could be from bullets. And uh, in any case, that's Buddha with the distended earlobes. He talked about the, the figures of Buddha last week. And uh, he's in the lotus position. Right, and it's it's absolutely gigantic. I believe Stockstead has the dimensions. No, she doesn't. <laughs> that would have been helpful. Um, but I do. I have seen pictures of people standing here in front of this uh, particular cave. Uh, I mean, figure inside the cave, and this is around seven feet here. So you can do the math. This is about fifty feet, fifty to sixty feet tall. It's huge. But it's not on the syllabus, so you don't have to know about it. But I just thought I'd show it to you. And look at the detail on his face and his expression. He's achieved nirvana. He's achieved enlightenment by the time this image of him was made. Well, of course, it was made after he died, but it's showing how he felt about having reached that state of acceptance that we discussed, you know, the fact that human suffering is caused by um, desire or greed, some people would say, and there's uh, several ways to overcome that, the enlightened path, right, that Buddha taught. Okay, now we get to a slight divergence from the syllabus, so this is important, and uh, I will explain. I looked and looked and could not find a slide of, uh, it was definitely not in Stockstad's file, at least the ones I have access to, or, or online, my wife and I both did the full 
Guam Sea Pagoda, the way it it um, looked in the edition of Stockstead when I created this syllabus about three years ago. So this is the image that if you're tested on, it is almost identical, but not exactly, to the one listed on your syllabus. So why am I even showing you this? Well, because there is a difference between the two main kinds of pagodas. So let's do it this way. Here we go. The next must know, I'm going to keep the name the same. So you don't have to write something across anything out. Fo Guang, I'll spell that F-O-G-U-A-N-G. Second word, C, you know, like this Spanish word. Yes, yeah, S-I. Pagoda, you, you may know. And that's going to be a definition I'm going to give you in just a minute. P-A-G-O-D-A. -A. Fo Guang, C, Pagoda, China, 1056 A.D. So let's define pagoda first before we talk about the meaning of uh, the, these two slides kind of go together, but one is meant to just give you context and that's this one and the actual one that might be on the exam just in case it's not clear and I'll explain and do the formal analysis will be this slide if it's on the final. Okay, so what is a pagoda? It's a short definition. Luckily, uh, I'm sure you don't want to write long ones at this hour. Uh, pagoda, okay is a multi-level temple with, it doesn't have to be Chinese. They're famous for them in China, but they have them in Japan, they have them in India, they have them in Burma. I mean, you may know it's all over Asia. So again, it's a multi, pagoda is a multi-level temple with wide overhanging eaves. So let's take a look at, this is the much better example. With wide overhanging eaves. That's what these are, part of the roof line, the part that sticks out over the walls, right? Eaves, right? So again, I'll start over. A pagoda is a multi-level temple with wide overhanging eaves supported by projecting wooden brackets. Let's go back up close. Supported by projecting them. The shadows always make it hard to see, but you, you can see that here. Right. I hope you can on your screens. Again, I'll repeat that one more time. Pagoda is a multi-level temple with wide overhanging eaves. If you prefer to write roof lines, you can because it means the same thing. With wide overhanging eaves or roof lines supported by uh, projecting wooden brackets. They're always wood. In fact, they're used here on the balconies too. So oh, these buildings are almost always wood. So why am I even showing you this one here? Because not all pagodas in the early years of pagodas, pagodas go back about 2000 years. First, they were Buddhist temples, but they can be um, Hindu or they can even be Shinto, which is an offshoot of Buddhism. So they're, that's why I didn't say a, Hindu, a Buddhist house of worship, but, but the first ones were. So what we have here is an early form of pagoda. And all you have to write about it and we'll go, past this and you can just focus on the slide that might be on the exam the next one but you notice it's not wood this is how they built them in china early on when buddhism first came to china the the pagodas their temples some of them were just one stories that make them they wouldn't have been then officially or technically pagodas just a single floor is not a pagoda so any of their temples whether one story or more were mostly made out of brick I've seen them. I've climbed some of them. There's one in Canton. Oops, I said Canton. Guangzhou. When I was a kid, it was called Canton. The largest city in southern China. Fascinating. Much older than Beijing. Much older. Wonderfully friendly people. I, I can recommend that. If you if you go to the north of China, it's it's kind of polluted and crowded and you know, just as busy as any big American city, but the, the pace of life was much more uh, calm. And I don't mean calm, like, you know, there's plenty of traffic and it's a city of 10 million people, like as big as greater Chicago is, but, but the pace of life was slower and the people were so friendly. I really am glad I did that. I, I took a side trip from Hong Kong by train and I only had three or four days, but I, I remember that visit the rest of my life. Everyone was wonderful. The city was was so full of historic buildings, including nine story pagodas, some of which were wood, but many of the oldest ones were like this. This one's from 600 and some, you have to know this. We're gonna to go to the next slide, the must know in just a minute. But just so you can see how it has the same shape, 
the wide overhanging eaves. But of course, they're not wood, so they don't have the, obviously they don't need, and therefore there's no reason to have the uh, brackets, the projecting brackets. And so the earliest Buddhist temples in China were made out of masonry, either stone or brick. So now we get to the more common type of uh, uh, temple like this one. And again, this is a pagoda. And I gave you the titles, that's right. Um, <clears throat> Fo Guang Si Pagoda, 1056. So now we're looking at the time by which this was built. Here's the first fact about the meaning. Uh, Buddhism had become the dominant religion. What does it say? Because most people call it a religion. So we'll call it a religion, even though technically it's more of a philosophy of life. But we'll say dominant religion. Buddhism, by the time this temple was built, definitely became the dominant religion throughout China. It was encouraged by the emperor and his family and his uh, inner circle. They weren't forced to convert, like sometimes happened with Christian and Muslim invaders in Europe, back and forth between, you know, those two two religions in the Middle Ages. But here in China, it was just it was just uh, you know by example. It was uh, encouraged by the emperor and his you know uh, family and other high-ranking officials because they had become Buddhist decades before this. So this is during the, uh, you know, high point of Buddhist influence in their culture throughout China. One way it shows is the temples. This is a Buddhist temple, a pagoda of what, how, seven stories? Is it one, two, three, four, actually six, okay. And they almost always ended with a finial. That's not a minor detail, so you should add that in your notes. That would be a, a decorative endpoint at the top. Uh, that's why I leave, left my cursor arrow there. That's pointing towards, you can guess, not heaven. Don't write that because that's a Christian concept. Remember, Buddhists didn't believe in a, the way Christians do, or at least many do, in you know a, a life after death in a place called heaven. That's not what the uh, Buddha taught, but a, a state of being called enlightenment or nirvana is another way of saying it. So that's why these temples, these Buddhist pagodas like this one here, always ended with at least once they were finished sometimes it was added decades later if they didn't have the skill or the money or the type of workers to make because this is very difficult work to climb up on a sloping roof line here like this and, and erect this 30 foot tall finial so they ended with finials most of them not all but most of them did you'll see that in the slides of other uh, pagodas after the break in in, in japan uh, because why because that's meant to symbolize the quest for enlightenment. Literally, it's meant to symbolize that, you know, uh, mission in life that if you follow Buddhist teaching, you should want to achieve before you die, which is the state of enlightenment, ultimate enlightenment, or nirvana is the word for it. And again, that is the name of one of my daughter's favorite bands from the 90s, but they got that word from, of course, Buddhism. <clears throat> so what you see here is a really beautiful. I, I don't know about how some of you see these things, but I love wooden architecture. It's so organic and so, you know, much a part of the land. And of course, these came from trees, these, these uh, wooden beams and, and uh, balconies and walls were all made uh, with local wood and they've survived. It's nearly a thousand years now. It's pretty impressive. When I was in um, Guangzhou, again, I got to get that right, not Canton, I found one, the oldest one there, it was from 900 AD, that is what, 11 centuries ago, and it was nine stories tall, well over 180 feet, and it survived all that, it's so beautiful, and it's not needed much repair, you know, a wooden beam here or there, you know, and some you know, the wood has to be polished and, you know, treated, right, like wood does, so it doesn't crack and things. Otherwise, it was the original handmade wooden structure from well over 11 centuries ago. Yeah, it's just fascinating. And of course, there was a statue of Buddha on the ground level. Usually, that's what's inside. If you're curious what's inside this, relics of Buddha's life, maybe, or images from his life, and a statue of him, usually a sculpture of him seated or standing. It could be either depending on, you know, how the local uh, artist wanted to portray Buddha, but always some image of him somewhere inside, usually on the ground floor. They didn't normally haul them up these narrow wooden stairs, <laughs> six floors, that would be hard to do. We know about larger than life images of Buddha, you know, maybe if they stood up and they were seated, or if they were standing, they might have been like eight feet, 
tall, solid stone um, that's a heavy object. So usually they just leave them on the entrance level at the ground level. Okay, that's the whole meaning here. Formal analysis, it's balanced, totally symmetrical left to right. And again, if you drew the line up at the top of the third floor, you got as much above as you do below. I would say it's balanced both directions. It's obviously both stable and dynamic. The uh, corners or edges of the walls are stable, aren't they? And the windows and doors, but the roof lines and the beams are all dynamic. There's the rhythm of the overhanging eaves. Again, that word is E-A-V-E-S if you want to write it. You don't have to worry about the spelling or you can say roof lines. They obviously project outward at an angle, therefore they're dynamic as are the beams, right? All of the beams are in a diagonal. Uh, and that creates rhythm, of course, repeated shapes of the roof lines, of the windows and the wooden beaming. Okay, and then the colors. Well, the walls and beaming, all the woodwork, in other words, is of course a warm earth tone, brown basically. And then here's your, your bluish green tile that the, is uh, the most popular. I know it's kind of faded into what looks almost dusty gray, but it actually these tiles when they're new, I've seen when they replace them, they, those have been replaced. There's no way those tiles would last over a thousand years. Uh, just even heavy birds landing on them or, or you know, heavy rainstorms would destroy some. So those are more recent, uh, probably, you know, in the last century. Uh, but the point is that those tiles, they made slightly uh, altered the color over time, but they are almost always, when they're new, they are bluish green, which of course is a cool color. The textures are all real. There's no cemented textures. The real rough texture of wood and the real smooth texture of clay tile. You can't really see, well, I guess you can if you go up close, glass in the window. So you could just, you don't have to write that because it's not visible here. Uh, there is modeling here. It's part of the design because the overhanging eaves, why did they make them that way? To protect against the elements, it gets quite hot and humid. Oh boy, when I climbed to the top of that nine story pagoda, I think I lost three or four pounds on the way up. <laughs> you sweat a lot, yeah, it was worth it. No elevator, obviously. Uh, so you you end up you know having such uh, intense heat in the summer all over China, really. Uh, and in the winter, of course, it would be very cold. It snows a lot. Uh, then you, um, you, you, well, not as much in the South, of course, but in any case, you can have extreme weather and it helps shield the people inside. And of course, who would be inside besides some worshipers? Uh, the monks or priests who, who, who maintain the building and, and uh, you know, attend every day services inside the building, religious ceremonies. Okay, and then let's see, are we forgetting a thing? Shadow modeling, oh, space, yeah, that would help. Six levels, over 100 feet tall, including the finial, it's more like 120 or so. But you could just say the six levels roughly equal height, not quite, uh, they're more like 15 feet each. Uh, so say nearly 100 feet, you know, probably 90 or 95 feet. And then about a 25, 30 foot, uh, or say about or nearly 30 foot finial above that. So it's all real space. And each level is a single large room. Okay, um, I think I covered it rhythm and dynamic. Okay, now we're gonna cut something. I'm sure you won't argue with that um, and we'll still take our break. Yeah, we will, a few minutes early. So cross off uh, the second slide on the list and that is um, Shang Dynasty Fang Ding. <laughs> Whenever I say that, I'm thinking of a <clears throat> Frank Sinatra song, right? From the 60s. <laughs> Sorry, I grew up with that stuff. <laughs> Ring a ding ding, he used to say at the end of his songs. Shang, S H N G, sign. It's number two. Cross it off. Why? Because the slides are terrible. The ones that I found, they, they were not only only black and white slides, but they were not even well focused. And so we got to cut something to save some time and you guys some writing. So everybody get that. Don't worry about the second slide down. You will not be on the exam. Now let's move on though to this one, which is the fourth slide down. Very important. This slide. Definitely not cutting it for the study list. Travelers, plural, right? Travelers among mountains and streams, just like it sounds, is the title. Travelers among mountains and streams. We know the artist's name, Fan Kuan, and it's two words, capital F-A-N and then capital K-U-A-N. The date, remember a little C you can ignore. That means we don't know the exact year. It's already rounded off to the century for you. 1000 AD or CE, whichever you prefer. Okay, why is this so important that I won't cut it for the study list? Because it brings up 
uh, our next definition, a whole technique of uh, art, uh, visual art, that was invented by the Chinese and that most Westerners never heard of, let alone know what it is. So it could appear this definition on the final. So here we go. It's at the bottom of the page before Pagoda, right? So if you flipped over to Pagoda, turn back to the previous page. Here we go. Chinese three-tier perspective. I'll explain how that applies to this after I give you the definition. Okay, I'll repeat this. I'll say it slowly, then repeat it once. Chinese three-tier perspective. Okay, it's a technique for depicting space invented by Chinese artists. This is one of them. Some people think he's the guy that invented it. We can't prove that. Again, the first part of the definition. A technique for depicting space invented by Chinese artists in which three things, so it isn't short, sorry, three things. Objects in the foreground are shown larger and clearer. Again, you could say sharper if you prefer. I'll say it again. Number one feature is that objects in the foreground, like the rocks and trees here, at the bottom, that's the foreground, right? Are shown larger and clearer. Number two, the middle ground is shown with a hazy, misty look. You see that? That's like clouds and mist rising from the valley below, right? So again, number two feature, second feature is Objects in the middle ground are shown with a hazy, misty look. And then number three, the last part of it, the definition, objects in the distance are shown smaller and clearer. In other words, the clarity repeats on the distant objects. You see them at the top of the mountain range here. These trees, right, where they're more like shrubs, right? And the rocks, look how detailed it is. But they're obviously smaller than these rocks here. In the individually, and the trees are obviously larger. I'll repeat that, okay. A Chinese feature tree perspective is a technique for depicting space invented by Chinese artists, comma, in which number one, objects in the foreground are shown larger and clearer. Number two, objects in the middle ground are shown with a hazy, misty look. And number three, objects in the distance are shown uh, smaller and clearer, you know, smaller proportionately each object. I don't understand the clearer part about that on the far ground. Well, is this clear here? Yeah, no, it's important. That's what we're here for. See this? You can't even see the wall of the cliff here. It is like it disappeared. That's because they are seeing this from the point of view of a landscape painter or something. And that's what this is. This is actually a painting. And mm -hmm. I'll explain who the guy was and everything in a minute. So. You see how this is sharp and clear here? Look at these rocks, right? Yeah. So look at that, yeah. Then that's that disappears in this section, which is because it's above the foreground, we just call it the middle ground. It isn't literally the middle third of the painting, obviously, it's way less than that. It's probably a sixth of the, but it is in the middle. So we call it the middle ground and that's obscured by, you know, like mist, which does happen in nature, in, in the real, uh, you know, landscapes, depending on what time of day and, and whether there's a, well, there is, they see there's a waterfall. So that would lead to, of course, a body of water, which might have mist, especially in the morning, right? Rising I'm just up. curious what the thought process was, because from my point of view, when things are further away, they're more hazy, not more clear. Yes. Good point, because that's the Western concept, as you know, you guys have all written, almost well, most of you have, of, huh. on either on your papers or on your midterm essay questions, if you describe the technique of atmospheric perspective. This is very different in, in a way. And yet, in some ways, it is a different version of that concept. They're seeing these things further away as though they were, I guess, like a bird in flight, right? Or, or, or someone who's just visualizing what the mountains in the distance would look like when there's no mist over them. Yeah, it's a good point you're raising. And again, I can't explain it better than that, but I think you get the gist of what we're saying. It's a way that Chinese artists starting around, the fact, right about this time, this technique was invented about a thousand years ago. It goes back that far for Chinese landscape painting, of course. And then it was copied in China, uh, sorry, Japan and Korea and Thailand and Burma. Uh, I've been to Southeast Asia, by the way. I wasn't in the war, thank heavens, the Vietnam War, but I've been to Vietnam 
and it's a beautiful country. And uh, I've seen their art, modern and older historic paintings from museums in Hanoi, you know, and then several parts of China. So yeah, it's just their way of, of visualizing something that uh, maybe they actually physically wouldn't see like this with their own eyes, but they can visualize how it would look. And they just came up with this philosophy. But this artist, so I hope that answers the best I can answer, but it, it's an understandable query you just raised. So for whatever concept reason, I think they were acting as though they thought they were like with a bird's eye view or something like that. And then mist would cause the middle section of this mountain range, if it was, you know, water down below, right, where you can't see it. Well, maybe you see it a little bit. There would be a mist and it would rise partway up the side of the mountain, but not all oh. the top. Yeah, that's how I visualize oh. what they're saying. And of course, they were also being poetic almost, literally. Many of these landscape paintings had poems attached to them. Okay, so, but that's not what you need to remember. Everyone has now written the definition. So let's go on to the uh, rest of the meaning of this. Okay, this was by an artist who was the most successful landscape painter at, of his day or of his time, his era, if you want to say his era. And some historians believe Fan Kuan invented the technique of Chinese three-tier perspective. We can't prove that, but that's just like with Da Vinci. Did Da Vinci invent chiaroscuro? Uh, right, we've covered that in Sumato. No one can prove it, but most historians now think he did. So just say many historians believe this artist created the technique we're looking at. In any case, it's classically a Chinese landscape painting, which included the following elements. There are the travelers, see them barely visible, overwhelmed by nature. The whole point of this is to show how magnificent and overpowering nature is compared to puny human beings, right? Or you don't have to say puny, but you know, a small mere mortals, you know, look how overwhelmed those travelers are. It's a small, maybe a, you're not a caravan, but a group of people traveling, perhaps, you know, a family, an extended family on a mountain road, right? Anyway, so what you see here are the elements, the last part of the meeting now, for Chinese landscape painting of this period. Now, this is a period, uh, after the Tang Dynasty, it's the next era, but it, the art was still very, very highly re respected as a profession. And uh, it was very, uh, this S-O-G, S-O-N-G song, like the word song, is the next dynasty. Our last must know, we're gonna get to it in just a couple of minutes, is from that era. So this is from a dynasty that came after the Tang, the Song Dynasty, when artists were still highly respected and their work was still highly valued. And uh, so anyway, the last part of the meeting now is that uh, these are the elements, rocks, and I say, huh, well, yeah, okay, boulders, if you prefer to write large rocks, meaning some would say boulders and rocks, really you got both here, right, Look, smaller rocks and boulders, so rocks and boulders, trees and bushes, <laughs> mountains, waterfalls, and streams, you can't quite see the stream, but let's get up close again. Maybe that's it there. I guess it is, right? You see just the edge of it. So streams or bodies of water, if you want to say that, but mostly streams and waterfalls. Mountain, right? You can say cliffs if you prefer, mountain sides or cliffs. Trees and bushes, which you see more bushes here and trees below, and rocks and boulders. And then usually, usually there is either a the only evidence of human presence is either the people at the bottom, like they are on the road here, these tiny human figures, uh, or a pagoda, sometimes with no people. So that's the one thing that's missing from classic Chinese landscape painting in this one. There are no pagodas visible. So instead, the human presence is just the people. All right, formal analysis. It's symmetrical, I think. It, not exact, but it's so close. The top of the mountain is slightly different here, but it's pretty close. So I would say it's roughly balanced left to right. And of course, top to bottom, depending on where you draw the line. For space, now that's really important. There is overlapping, obviously, of the different objects, the further away they are. There is diminishing size here because obviously these bushes and trees are smaller than these, right? Uh, so there's diminishing size. And I think I see foreshortening. I don't know about, about everyone here, but I think there's a bit of foreshortening on the side of the mountain and maybe even on these large boulders. So I would say there is some foreshortening, you know, a limited amount or some uh, small amount of foreshortening. There's definitely diminishing size and overlapping, but the main technique 
obviously is Chinese three-tier perspective. The colors are warm. These are the actual colors, kind of gold and off-key and, and neutral because it's black paint or ink. I think it's paint, uh, but I know the background is gold uh, kind of, or tan, like tannish gold. And they use those colors quite often together. So there's no cool colors here. There's warm and I guess you could say neutral on the dark objects. There is bold outline around the main objects, certainly around these boulders and around the main mountain cliff, but there's also thin outlines around the trees. It, there's obviously the rhythm of the trees, the boulders, the cliffs, um, <clears throat> right? And then it's dynamic only in some parts. I think it's mostly stable. The, the mountain's pretty straight upright, but there are dynamic details. These trees even are pretty upright, right? But then some of the trees are curved with their branches like trees in real life and these boulders are dynamic so it's both um and then the largest mass is the cliffs in the background and then i would say it's a it depends, it's up to you do you think this is one mass if you see it that way then the largest second largest mass would be the clump of trees in the lower right and then third largest would probably be these uh, boulders if you look at them as a single mass okay uh and the cement texture is superb he was a really very great painter because he, I think he captured the tech, uh, texture of rocks and trees and bushes excellently. Okay, let's wrap up this segment. And this one won't take as long. It's our last plus number before we take the break. Song Dynasty, I already spelled that, it's like the word song. Dynasty Guan Ware Vase. Guan is G-U-A-N. And then the next word is Ware, you know, as in something you make. W-A-R-E, vase, of course it's a vase. Song Dynasty Guan Ware Vase, China, 1250 AD. The Song Dynasty was a period of less stability, including some um, warfare between different sections of, of China. It wasn't a period of chaos, but it was a period of, of some, you could just say instability, political uh, and economic um, hardship for a lot of the population. They weren't always able to, you know, count on, you know, the local officials because many of them were either corrupt, incompetent, or it wasn't as like, in other words, it wasn't a golden age of Chinese history, but neither was it, I don't want to overstate it and say, oh, this is a period of decline and chaos. It wasn't that extreme, but there was definitely more hardship among the average population. And yet, a uh, big surprise, guess who didn't suffer? The upper classes, they still prized art and artists were still valued and paid well for their work. One form of art that was greatly prized by the upper classes, you can say the rich if you prefer, was vase or ceramic ware. This is a brilliant example, and this is the only main part of the meaning here. There's not a lot to say about it, uh, but it is important to understand. This is symbolic of the balance that Buddhism teaches you to seek throughout your life or through society, that society itself should have. I'll say it again. There are several ways in which the design of this vase symbolizes the balance that Buddhism teaches people to seek through its teachings. And you might go, huh, it's just an object. How does that, well, it does. So follow, follow this. It does that in several ways. One is a balance between the bowl Obviously, that's what this part of a vase is. And the neck, they cover the same area down to like a millimeter or something. If you drew the line, you know, if this were to be actually like that, right, that would be the top. It, it's been measured. It's well designed. It's well documented. So just write it that way, even if it doesn't look obviously like that. Again, I'll repeat that, that there is a balance between the space covered by or encompassed, you could say, enclosed by the bowl and the neck. They're the same. There's a balance between warm and cool colors. Now, this slide is not as good as the one I had on my own when I actually had a physical, but it's the best I could find on, on the uh, uh, internet to show red crackle technique. And that's just like it sounds. Yes, there's a candy bar, with that thing. <laughs> but with a C, right? Crackle. The red crackle is part of the design. And when you get up close, you can, I think you can see it's red, even though it may look a little off base here. That's a warm color and it's a technique baked into the ceramic before it's fired in a kiln. And then this is gold. The bottom and the top are gold, actual real gold paint. Obviously gold is a warm color, but the base, uh, I mean the vase, the 
surface I mean, of the vase is almost all a bluish green. And of course, that's cool. So you see a balance again, in, in this case, between warm and cool colors. And then you see a balance between the last way in which it's symbolic of ba balances that Buddha's teaching uh, requires you to seek or recommends or encourages people to seek in life. It's also symbolized by the stable elements or sections, I better say stable section, the neck and the dynamic portion, the entire bowl and the base, which are round. So it's balanced in three different ways that are not by you know accident. It's very conscious part of the design. And the, the technique used here again, the last fact about the meaning, then we'll do a quick formal analysis and take a break, is that it's called the red crackle, or just for short, crackle technique. Usually red was used for these lines. Don't ask me how they did it. Some of you may have made ceramics. I never did. My mother was a sculptor, but she never used her skills for any kind of vases or anything. So I have no idea, but it's just baked into that, you know, and it's called the crackle, C-R-A-C-K-L-E technique. Here it's red lines. Okay, formal analysis. Well, I did part of it already, but how big is it? It's about um, 18 inches tall. And of course, I already said it's balanced. Uh, I would say top to bottom because this area equals this area, even if it doesn't look obviously like it does, it does. And between warm and cool colors, I already covered that. Now the textures, it's all real smooth ceramic, of course. Uh, and you could say with gold overlay on the top and bottom, but that's a real texture. There's no similar textures. It is both stable, obviously on the neck and dynamic on the you know lip, the base and the bowl. So it's both. Uh, it's a single object. There's no other masses, just one object. For space, I already mentioned, yeah, I covered that. Let's see. Oh, rhythm. Yeah, the rhythm is is in the this uh, curved lines of the bowl, the base, and the neck, as well as the crackle pattern, of course. And line here is baked in. I mean, you can't say it's drawn, painted, or carved. <laughs> it's baked, baked line, <laughs> baked into the ceramics, so there's no drawn line. Uh, and uh, let's see, what do we uh, over? Oh, there's no modeling. It's just the shadows from the museum. And the rhythm is obvious. I already think I already mentioned that. Okay, well, let's take our break. It is 8.02. So let's try to get back here at about 8.15. Does that work? Because we, we can still end early if we, you know, the, it's up to you how many questions you have. Uh, that's what we're here for. We may end up going all the way to 9.25, say, but that's still not quite 9.30. I think we can end at least five minutes. Early. All right. See you guys in about 13 minutes. Okay. All right. I'm going to pause the thing here. Okay. Um, all right. Let's see. Now, this is the next must know, but I did intend, I want to make sure everybody has this opportunity. You don't have to, but if you can stick around for two minutes after the last slide, I will make sure I don't talk to the last minute. We'll stop the slides by 9.22 or so, 9.25. And then after that, immediately after that, uh, I'll finish up with this uh, diagram I meant to show you at the beginning, but there was so much else to talk about. It's a very easy to understand and quickly, you know, visible uh, chart of a few lines that explains how, in case you did not get an A or a B on either the first paper or the midterm or both, you can still get an A in the class. And uh, it's one of the ways that I encourage students not to get discouraged. And I'll explain it uh, at the very end and then still stick around after that if there are other questions. Okay, so here we go. This is the first must know slide on, on Japanese art, but I should give you literally a one minute quickie thumbnail context uh, information. As some of you may know, Japan is one of the five largest economies in the world. And for a country with a relatively smaller population, about 125, 130 million, somewhere in there, it's fairly stable, it's not really growing or losing population lately. A country as the size of California with more than four times, no, more than three times as many people. There are 40 million people in California, you probably know that, so you can do the math. It's uh, over three times as crowded as California is. Uh, and it produces something in, uh, in the order of a third of the gross national product, but still it's always listed as some sources make it third, but one of the top five, usually fourth or fifth largest economy in the world. Pretty amazing achievement. And it was an early 
example of a society with an urban civilization, but it isn't one of the of oldest. It's not, you know, recent, but it's not as old an urban society or quote civilization, unquote, as China or India. So I didn't list it as one of the five oldest in the world, but it's still quite old. And finally, as we get started here, it was isolated by choice of their emperors uh, for th hundreds of years. I didn't say thousands, I was going to say it's for several centuries. They kept all foreign contact away from China with one brief exception. They actually did allow missionaries in the early Christian missionaries in the early 1500s, but not long after that, they were expelled violently actually uh, and not allowed back. So there wasn't any contact with the West or even with the rest of Asia until the mid 1800s. And we'll finish with this. It was Vallejo, yes, as in the city here in the Bay Area from where Commodore Perry, you may know this if you took American history, and remember uh, who opened up uh, Japan to the world. He, he made, uh, he was ordered by the, I forget it was the president before Lincoln uh, to make that voyage uh, to Japan to see if they were willing to open up their island to trade. And they were when they met with him and saw American you know, manufactured goods and they had things to trade. That began the um, very rapid modernization of Japan, which of course allowed them to become one of the world's major powers militarily and economically very, very soon, within a, a two generations, they were able to defeat the entire Russian Navy in 1905, only 50 years later, which is a major feat because they weren't even in contact with Western powers and warfare and, and you know, uh, techniques. So they rapidly became part of the modern world, but the points we're looking at, they weren't. Okay, here's our first must know slide of Japanese art. Inner shrine at Ise. Inner, is like the word inner shrine at Ise. I-S-E. It's the village it's at, located. Japan, of course, all these slides are located in Japan. By the way, we're going to cut one of these slides so we can end a little early. I'll tell you which one when we get toward the end. But not this one. It's an important one. I'm not cutting this from the study list. Inner shrine at Ise, Japan, circa 100 or 100. You don't have to write AD, right? Because we don't have in the Japanese slides, they're all common error. So you can say CE or AD, but you can just, if it's on the exam, just write the year 100. It's already rounded off. Okay, why are we looking at a black and white photo of a small temple? That's what it is. Because of its symbolic importance to Japanese Buddhist thinking, you could say, or teaching. Buddhism, in other words, had reached Japan by this time, by a hundred years after, you know, the common era, after the birth of Christ, of course. And, and by this time, Japan, most Japanese were, not all, but most, uh, most historians believe this, had converted voluntarily to Buddhism. So around the island, all around Japan, there were various types of temples, some as small, right, and modest as this one. And many of them you'll see in the next few slides, multi-story pagodas with very ornate decorations. But this is a simple, plain form of a pagoda, a Buddhist temple, which is not a, uh, really a pagoda. I'm sorry, I said it was pagoda. I meant temple. A shrine in, implies a religious site, of course. So I'll say it again. It's a very modest version of a Buddhist temple, a small Buddhist temple in a small village on the coast, literally near the ocean on the coast of Japan, where the uh, livelihood is both farming and fishing. The population has been farming and fishing to support their families for thousands of years. The proof is right here because this temple was built uh, almost 2000 years ago. Really, you're looking at it, some of you must be thinking, wow, it's in good shape <laughs> for 2000 years. Actually, this is from 2013. Am I deliberately misleading people? No, there's an explanation. This building was first erected exactly the way you see in this photo, which is an old black and white photo, of course. It's the only one I found on the internet that shows the whole building clearly. So it was originally built uh, about 100 AD or CE as a Buddhist 
a Japanese, which is the variations people call that. Some people Shinto, S-H-I-N-T-O. That word really is a more later concept. So just say Japanese version of Buddhism. Uh, and it was meant to symbolize the balance again. You see, that's the whole underlying thing that, you know, you keep hearing repeated now from last week, I think, and this week, to, in both ja Japanese and, and Chinese Buddhist architecture is and art, is that much of their art, Buddhist art from Asia, any Asian country, is meant to visually symbolize the concept of balance. So how does this do that? Well, you could start by saying the building itself is balanced. It's symmetrical. Yeah, of course, but uh, most buildings are, except Frank Gehry's <laughs> museums. <laughs> He's deliberately unbalanced in his buildings. But even now, most buildings are balanced. So that, that's not the point. It is balanced. We'll do the formal analysis, of course, and, and say how visually. But it's, it's more than that. It's the function of the building and the fact that it is just torn down Dismantle is the word I was looking for. Dismantled every 20 years, roughly once a generation, and rebuilt by the next generation. That's a major detail. So why, why does that symbol or how does that symbolize balance in Buddhist teaching? First, because all of the people of that village who are physically capable, unless they're totally disabled, you know, from physical labor, they are required to work on it. So that's how the balance comes in. It's a project that brings the whole community together in a balanced way. How so? Young and old. You're not too old. You can't say, hey, I'm over retirement age. I'm over 70 or 80. Or nope, it doesn't matter. If you're, if you're mobile, you go down to the beach where this is and you help re-erect it. Reconstruct is a better word. You take it apart and then you rebuild it exactly the way it has been every 20 years for 19 centuries now. Okay, and then another way there's balance in the symbolic, you know, building or structure of how, I mean, uh, process, I mean, on the process of how this built. Another form of balance is between the rich and the poor. It doesn't matter how wealthy you are, how much land you own or how much business you do you get your hands dirty, you go down and you work on it, as well as the poorest, you know, farmer. And even if there are homeless, I have no idea if there were, they would be expected to come down here and work on this too. And also, you know, children, of course, I said older, I didn't quite complete that point about balance and age, of course, between the youngest. Now, of course, a baby or a toddler, no, but even the very young grade school age children, you know, primary school age children, you know, uh, four or five years old, have a task. And then there is the, my favorite thing about the balance is the purpose of the building once it's completed, okay? Oh, and by the way, men and women equally. Women don't just watch the men work on it. They get involved physically in helping with the reconstruction. But finally, the, the most important way it's balanced is the function of it. The upstairs is used as a worship space, you know, for Buddhist ceremonies. The downstairs is a granary or storage space. And that is where the village really shows by example what Buddhism is supposed to teach, which is in times of need, if you're one of those people who have an unfortunate incident, like you lost your crops to, you know, drought, fire, plague, uh, your family members, you know, are injured, flood, whatever, it doesn't matter. If you were uh, unable to feed your own family, or even individually yourself, you could have uh, enough grain to get through the winter, at least, you know, to get through to when the next planting season was, or, or when, you know, you were able to fish or hunt enough to start feeding yourself. And of course, the village elders, right, the leaders of the community would, 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 uh, would decide that. But that's, everyone has to contribute to that, too. So you see how it's balanced in multiple ways. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, you're supposed to give a certain amount, I think it's a percentage of what you produce on your farm or from your fisheries, you know, fishing. Uh, well, they wouldn't be able to store, so probably not fish, just the grains, you know, obviously the uh, non-perishable goods, which people could use as much as, you know, several months later during the winter if they needed to, because they were you know, hungry or not able to feed themselves or their family. So, you know, you might say it's an early form of socialism, but in any case, it's the Buddhist concept underlying it that the building symbolizes in multiple ways. 
So that's the main part of the meaning. The only other thing I'll say, some of you may know if you've seen any kind of Japanese architecture, this is a classic example of the simple, elegant, you could say, a functional organic is the word uh, most American architects like Frank Lloyd Wright used. It. They love Japanese architecture. Julia Morgan, the woman I've been mentioning, Maybach, they all went to Japan and studied Japanese architecture at the beginnings of their careers or near the beginning. Wright lived in Japan for a couple of years and designed buildings all over Japan. So what you have is the simple organic design of a building with all natural materials and no excess or uh, superfluous, there's a the word I'm looking for, no unnecessary or superfluous decoration, which is clean, simple lines and surfaces. You could summarize it that way. That's overall the concept behind traditional Japanese architecture. And that doesn't just mean for temples, as you probably know, Japanese tea houses, residences, town halls, you know, all kinds of buildings, public and private buildings have that concept behind. The simpler, the better. The materials are obvious. What they're built out of is natural, all local materials, not decorated or disguised in any way. And uh, they're simple and plain. The surfaces and, and the uh, interior and exterior both of Japanese buildings, are, that's the way they've been for centuries. And it's an inspiration to modern architects all over the world from the last 150 or say 120 years at least. Okay. So let's do the formal analysis. It's a black and white photo. I can tell you the color is yellow. It's a soft pine kind of wood with grass. That's what that is, a grass roof. Uh, it, thatch is the word, right? Dried grass, of course. And that's gold color. And then walls are a yellow pine. So it's warm. There's no cool colors here. And we have the rhythm of the, of course, uh, cross beams that uh, help support or hold, I should say, hold down the uh, ridge pole, the ridge pole or ridge beam, actually most people call it. ridge beam is supported by the cross beams. And that creates rhythm as do the eaves. That's what an eave is. If you weren't sure before, you see this section of where the roof overhangs and the brackets. And then of course the posts that support the balcony and uh, allow the first floor to be used as a storage space. Uh, it, it's for space. It's a two story structure uh, with about a, uh, a, an eight foot high ceiling on the ground floor and about 15 feet, not even eight, it's more like seven feet high and about a 15 foot high ceiling in the upper level, the, the uh, uh, ceremonial chamber or worship space. And of course it's dynamic on the roof lines, but everything else below the roof is stable. All right angles everywhere, the posts, the walls, right? the projecting beams. Um, <clears throat> okay, and then the materials or texture, I'm sorry, is all natural. Uh, real, no simulated textures, real rough thatch or grass. You can just say grass because it's dry grass on the roof and everything else is real smooth, sanded, obviously. They call it polished, but that means sanded wood. And of course, varnished to preserve it. So that creates a real smooth texture of the wood. The modeling is just the natural shadows from the sun. The largest mass is the roof and then the upper floor and then the grain storage area or the first level. Uh, I think, yeah, so I think that that total, right, of the space between the far ends of the walls is, is greater than the sum total of these beams, which maybe are the fourth largest space. And the lines here are all visual. There's no carved lines, no painted lines on this. There wouldn't be in Japanese architecture or very little. If There might be a few carved lines on the interior, but uh, not visible here. And of course, it's balanced symmetrical left to right. And I would say if you draw the line down the middle of the upper floor, it is also roughly balanced top to bottom. Okay, this is a very uh, good slide. It's the first time I've ever been able to use this slide because um, I had these old, terribly badly faded slides that were in the slide library before. Uh, this is the next must know. And this is Buddhist, right? Remember that's with two Ds, Buddhist, B-U-D-D-H-I-S-T, temple, Buddhist temple at Nara. And that's a city in Japan, N-A-R-A, -A, Japan 607. So what is this? Well, the titles, Stockstead does this a lot. It's kind of misleading. A temple? Well, you can look and see in the photo, there's a bunch of buildings here. It's really a compound. 
a community of Buddhist monks living in the countryside outside of Kyoto. You don't have to know where it is. It's, it's a very old city, much older than Tokyo. Just say it's a very old community. Well, you can see the year 607. That would be the early Middle Ages in Europe. That was the Dark Ages. So what are we looking at? We're looking at, an, of course, from an aerial view from above, a group of buildings that are part of a religious compound or retreat. Compound is the aspect of the collection of buildings. That's what a compound is, right, obviously. But retreat is more what it does. These were buildings meant to allow Buddhist monks and converts to Buddhism to retreat from the real world, from the burly, hurly, whatever word you're hurly, burly, I can never say that, you know, from the noise and distraction of everyday life. I know it sounds funny. 600s AD, life must have been quiet. Well, no, not in the cities. It wasn't even that far back. So if you want to get away from the distractions uh, and the stress of everyday you know, life in the towns of Japan, and you were either already converted to or decided to convert to Buddhism, and you showed up at this retreat if you were willing to work every day to support yourself while you live here because they didn't give you anything you made your own food you made your own clothes it's a really important part of the meaning of this that was a philosophy here of many buddhist retreats not just in japan but especially of japanese or some people called it by this time shinto s-h-i-n-t-o is japanese form of buddhism in those retreats, you you are not a freeloader or, you know, a student who might have, you know, a stipend. And if you were lucky, your parents would no, you gave up all your worldly possessions when you showed up here, except the clothes on your back. And even those then because you made your own. And of course, you would be dressed in the simplest kinds of robes as a Buddhist monk. You've all seen pictures of Buddhist monks, I'm sure, on the news and things like what's happening in Burma right now. Boy. Are there things that keep people from developing cities around this area oh it's in the mountains that's a good question again excellent questions tonight yeah i meant to say that where is this it's in the mountains very high up in the mountains i don't know a couple thousand three four thousand just say a few thousand feet above sea level and uh, there's no big city close enough to do more than perhaps a day it might be a day's travel now the, the cities of Japan, of course, have mushroomed. The biggest city in the world, everyone knows this, right? Is Tokyo, 35 million people. Well, that's in the metro area, but still that qualifies as the largest metropolitan area on earth is Tokyo, Japan. And it was one of the first cities in the world to have a million people. Uh, so I think we mentioned that, didn't we? Or did we, I can't remember that. Anyway, we definitely are, no, that's right, in Art 1.2. So just say that at the time this was built, there were only a few medium size they weren't big metropolises but medium size uh, t t cities but none of them were, were closer than a day's ride away okay by horse of course right and this would have been uh far enough away to not be affected by urban distractions that's the whole point why they chose this site it's in the mountains above today the city it's above is like six million or something kyoto you have to know that fact but that's in central japan so it was chosen carefully as a uh you know, very um, isolated location. So you wouldn't be. Now I'm going to go up close because I didn't have this picture before. Now you can tell these ain't Buddhist monks. <laughs> these are, they are tourists visiting. But here you have, not here, but I think here, you got, it's still a functioning, the point is, it's still a functioning Buddhist retreat. These might, might have changed, but the last time I checked when I first started teaching this class, actually it's almost 10 years ago now, world art. We didn't have world art when I was hired here. It wasn't even offered, uh, but now it really ought to have been, but it is now. By the way, I want to give credit where it's due. Sarah Gill, my mentor, the one who asked me to join the faculty, wrote one of the two textbooks you guys use, the critics sees, and is now retired. Uh, she created this whole course and did an excellent job of doing that, bringing together the slides and the information. And then I've added my own from my travels, of course, over the years. So what we see here, is a pagoda and then these other buildings are not pagodas so the only temple is this one so let's go up close to it and see that isn't that nice look how ornate that is and it is from the 700s i think or 600s yeah it's over 14 centuries old i would love to go here if i've never been to japan anybody here been to japan 
Yeah, because I, I have friends who have it, including other professors. And when they go, they say, you know, Tokyo, okay, you know, it's a big modern metropolis, crowded and noisy and stressful, right? Uh, you know, it depends on what you want to do there. Maybe you want to stay there a few days. But most of my friends who went there to Japan over the last 30 years, I know maybe four people that done, they almost immediately leave Tokyo and go out to the countryside in places like this where they can feel what it would have been like to live in Japan back in the heyday of these Buddhist uh, retreats. And they still are, this is still a functioning Buddhist uh, retreat, but it allow, of course allows up if they charge something for this to help keep the, up, the maintenance of it and uh, the upkeep of it. So here's a pagoda, obviously this is a pagoda. It has all those features we've been discussing, you know, the wide overhanging eaves, projecting wooden beams, multi-levels, of course, one, two, three, four, five, and a Buddhist, Japanese Buddhist temples, and many others too, not just in Japan, but just say specifically, especially, I guess, in Japan, the Buddhist uh, temples, and particularly their taller pagodas, almost always have a very prominent, and look at that, that's about a 40 foot high, or 30, not something like 30, yeah, 30 foot high um, finial, Finials are a basic feature of, you remember we did talk about them with Indian stupas too. Not all Indian stupas have them, but most. And just about every uh, Buddhist pagoda I've seen in Japan at least, and much of the rest of Asia do too. But let's go back to the, if it's on the test, it's the view you'll have. So what are these other buildings? Residential halls, workshops. I think the residential halls are around the edge. Workshops. And this is the communal dining area. And then the main gathering room for lectures, prayers, you wouldn't say sermon, that's usually associated with Christian religious beliefs and practice, but, but that's sort of what they're like. And of course, the other really more focused religious ceremonies, you know, which of course would include the high priest, whoever that is there, uh, of course, conducting such ceremonies would be held in the pagoda or temple, you can say either word, because it is, it's kind of a temple. And then I'm not sure what the purpose of this house is, but I do know, or this building, that, that, that there are multiple purpose buildings. Of course, it's a self-contained community, quite literally a walled community up in the mountains. And of course, you could easily leave behind the cares of the urban world, but, but you weren't allowed to sit and relax. You had to produce your own food. That meant farming, fishing, maybe in the streams, of course, we're talking about not ocean fishing. You had to go all the way down to the Pacific to do that, but to, you know, have local fresh food and farming also both you know uh and then you made your own clothes and you maintained your own you know apartment or, or space or bedroom maybe just had I think probably just one bedroom for each maybe share even you know and perhaps you made your own bed and bedding and it was, it was totally a self-sustaining self-contained community in the countryside up in the mountains of uh, rural Japan. Okay, formal analysis. Here's your blue-green tile I've been talking about all night. Look at it. It is definitely a cool color. And here the warm colors are dominant, but you can't see them in this photo, so you just have to write it because you saw this, right? Obviously, this is wood, and wood is almost always a warm, what well, is always, an earth tone, and usually dark brown. So the walls of the buildings are wood, that's the real texture, by the way, real rough texture of wood and then real smooth texture of tile. So there's no cement textures. And the colors are a mixture of cool green tile and warm wooden walls. Uh, for space, well, you've got different sizes here, but you can just focus on this structure. <clears throat> you know, so you don't have to analyze if it's on the final, all of these structures. You can say the, the largest structure is the temple or pagoda, say it either way, which has five levels. And it is roughly 90 feet tall. And then the spike just a little under, not quite, or just, okay, almost, if you want to say, almost 100 feet with about a 30 foot high spire. So it reaches to about a total height of about 120 feet. And of course, each of these levels has one large room in them. And then the other buildings have divided rooms in them, you know, like the workshops and the uh, dorms, of course, and, and the eating. Uh, compound, um, cafeteria, if you want to call it that, uh, would, would have more than one room in each. Uh, it's dynamic on the roof lines and stables on the walls, pretty straightforward. And every, each structure is 100% balanced, left to right, symmetrical, as you can see even from this view here. Balanced left to right and top to bottom. 
and I, I don't really see any way in which they're not balanced. I already mentioned the textures, right? The real textures. There is modeling from the deep shadows of the sun and here you can't see much line. But when you get up close, yes, there would be visual line around the, uh, the roof lines or the eaves. Oops, I meant to go to this view and then we'll go to the next slide. Um, and the rhythms obvious with the projecting roof lines or eaves and the beams. But here you can see there's um, some carved line a little bit just on the edges of the of the roofs it's minimal but you can't see it so in this picture it's so it's certainly not in the overview of it so you don't have to write that you just say mostly visual line formed by the corners of the building and the walls and doors and windows all right um that's a different view than i was going to show you so there we go it's a close-up of this oh this is fascinating anybody here been to honolulu I thought I saw some of you say uh, Hawaii, right? I have. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, you probably you didn't stay in Honolulu. Most American uh, mainlanders, I guess they are, right? Or Howleys, as they used to call it. But did you happen to go outside Honolulu and see this site? Because there's a replica, a completely exact replica down to the last detail made in the 60s by the government of Japan as get this of this temple and all of the surroundings the entire site was recreated from the original which is of course this one in Japan outside Honolulu about 15 20 miles it's beautiful it's a Buddhist retreat it's functioning just the way the original did hundreds of years earlier and guess why it was made you don't have to know this, but you could. I think it's a, a fascinating fact. The Japanese government was trying to make amends for Pearl Harbor. And you know, that kind of is poignant, if not touching to think about, because of course they'd already endured the two nuclear bombings that ended that war. And yet they still wanted to make a gesture of reconciliation. I, but that, how Buddhist is it? You know, I'm not trying to promote any religion here. That's not my role. And that's up to you guys. What you believe in is your business. But, you know, it does say something pretty positive about that philosophy or religion of Buddhism. That that's how they saw their role after World War II. It took them 20 years to raise the money. And then in the 60s, they actually constructed the site. So you probably never got there, right? The person that went to Honolulu, because most Americans don't even know it's there. But uh, people from Hawaii know, and, and a lot of tourists do go to there. Now, this is the one in, so let me give you the title, the full title, uh, in, in Japan. And it is the Biodo Inn. I love the way that uh, word sounds when you say it. <laughs> slowly biodo b-y-o-d-o hyphen i-n not two n's be aware it's not an inn it's not a place to stay for tourists for visitors that's an actual word in japanese which in parentheses it's part of the title like the city in arizona phoenix hall that's the english name for it p-h-o-e-n-i-x in case you've never been to or, or seen the name of the city in arizona phoenix same exact spelling phoenix hall again biodo in uh, uh, parentheses phoenix hall <laughs> japan of course 1053 wow this is high shinto buddhist now you definitely could say by this time that was a concept a phrase a term used both in japan and later on by historians looking back at this period which is the mid medieval period in europe not early or late medieval that term is used you know i think i mentioned this if i didn't pretty sure yeah i did last week that's a term used by, by historians all over the world just like you know various other things common error you know common to who to what well the western world from the birth supposedly we don't know when christ really was born but roughly two thousand years ago you know so it's just one of those terms that's used as a common uh, reference point so they would have said that this is mid-medieval in the history of Japan, and high, as in the high point, of Shinto Buddhism. And we're going to talk about Shinto Buddhism with the last must-know slide, which is a very high probability of being on the exam in one of my favorite works of art in this entire class that I think you'll enjoy seeing. We're going to end with it. But for now, just write that this was built during the mid-medieval period of Japanese Shinto Buddhism, which did believe a little bit differently than mainland you know, as in China and uh, what before in India, when Buddhism started, believed in, in uh, which is that you actually, it was okay. You can see from this, let's get up close, 
they didn't think that excessive ornament was bad, wrong, or, or, or contrary to the symbolism of Buddhist simplicity and the simple life and the balance. It's just, they weren't concerned about that. They thought it was okay to decorate their buildings, especially their temples. And as, as the medieval period wore on, like you saw in that last slide, 600, here we are 400 years later, the buildings, uh, Shinto Buddhist temples got more ornate. This qualifies as a pagoda. It doesn't have to have a minimum of three or more stories. Most pagodas are at least three stories. This one is only two. But if you ever see the one outside Honolulu, I don't think you'll forget the experience. It's just so beautiful. Um, it, it's out in the mountains uh, above. Of course, it's on uh, Oahu, and it would be the, let me do the math, the east side of that island, right? Over the mountain pass. I don't know if any of you ever, I rented a car when I was there. <clears throat> so I could drive around the whole island, not just stay in Honolulu. It's really beautiful, the whole island, of course, but especially the site. And they chose it that way because the one in Japan that we're looking at is also in a rural mountainous site, just like that last slide of the Nara compound. And this is a compound too. Again, when they say Biodo Inn, it sounds like a single building. And it, as I say, it has nothing to do with what the word inn means in English. It's a compound, a religious compound for Shinto Buddhist monks to be a self, again, self-sustaining, self-supporting community where they did <clears throat> their own hunting and fishing. Mostly they didn't hunt, you know, but uh, some people would, I would not argue. Fishing is a kind of hunting, you could say, obviously. But they supported themselves in Japan. I'm not sure about the ones here in uh, Honolulu in, in the U.S. <clears throat> I mean, it's not Honolulu, in, in Oahu, in Hawaii. I'm not sure about that one. I can't remember if I ever got to ask them because there's so many tourists. It was overwhelmed with tourists. I was there in the middle of the tourist season. <clears throat> and they were from all over the world. Many of them from Japan actually coming to see what the their government and the Buddhist church from their own culture had done in uh, America uh, as a, an echo of the original Buddhist place. Okay, so people support themselves, just keep it simple, with farming and fishing mostly. And they make their own clothes, just like what we said about the Nara retreat or compound. <clears throat> and then they also, of course, spend time contemplating the um, teachings of Buddha. And yet they also believe in a different version of Buddhism. And I'm going to describe it with the last slide, but I can briefly mention as part of the meaning. You should write one of the last two facts you should have about the meaning of this slide. They had a form of uh, Shinto Buddhism. Not all Shinto Buddhism believes this, called Pure Land Buddhism. And that is almost the same as the Christian concept of heaven, which is not what Buddha taught, of course. But, you know, every religion has had variations and offshoots, right, and, and derivatives. I mean, of course, you know, Catholics and Protestants split. The Eastern Orthodox Church split from Rome even before that. And then there's the, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons, and yet they're all roughly Christian or, you know, nominally Christian. So it's the same thing with Buddhism. There have been many branches of Buddhism. So just say the Japanese branch by this time had split again within Japan one of which was a subcategory, you could say, or subheading of Buddhism, of Japanese Buddhism, was called pure, just like the word sounds, two words, pure land Buddhism. They believed there was a holy place, a sacred place you could actually physically go to when you died. Well, that's very, very similar to Christian belief in heaven. And that's the only branch I know of. I mean, there may be one, I'm not aware of, of Buddhism that, that taught that. And I'll explain how that was taught and what the details were when we get to the last slide. <clears throat> so this is during the period of the golden age of Shinto Buddhism and when there was some belief in a life after this, not just you, you know, your soul goes up into you know, space and disappears into the universe, which is roughly what the concept of, of course, enlightenment or achieving nirvana yeah, you lose yourself, right? That's not what they taught. The Shinto um, Pure Land Buddhist people did believe your soul survived and you you could go to a different place in another level, you know, afterlife, in other words. And this temple may or may not have taught that. I don't remember if they did. It might have been the mainstream Shinto, but just say it was a Shinto temple built during that period when they were already developing into various branches, including the Pure Land version, and also generally all the Shinto Japanese temples I've seen are much more ornate than most other Buddhist temples outside Japan. 
Okay, that's the whole meaning. But I think I might have located, I hope I did. Yeah, but, oh yeah, this is so, you have to write this. Well, yeah, it's one last fact about the meaning. Look what's inside. The one in Hawaii is equally beautiful, but of course it ain't, look at the walls. You can tell this is really the original thousand year old structure. There's a seated Buddha in the lotus position. Right, look at, oh, it's just wonderful. And he's in a contemplative mood, meaning he's, you know, meditating or contemplating on his own philosophy. And he's got literally lotus leaves underneath him. And it's gold, real gold. This is a wonderful photo. It, that, uh, when I was there, the new statue in the, the new recreated version of this in Hawaii has an equally large and impressive figure. And it's intact because it's so new and it does have real gold on it. I'm kind of amazed that hasn't been stolen, but uh, I assume there's some way to keep security 24 hours a day. So this was also one that would have been, you know, a very valuable, probably the best sculptor in that community, that area of Japan was hired to do this image of the seated Buddha. Um, and then yes, what looks like gold would have been gold. So you can wrap up your meaning notes on this with the fact that inside the main pagoda, is a larger than life, there, there we go, statue of a seated Buddha in the lotus position, covered in gold, not solid gold, that'd be way too expensive, but, but covered in gold, you know, gold leaf, it's called, on the, you know, on the whole outside, it's been gilded, is the other way to say it, uh, so it's covered in gold, real gold, uh, both the one in Hawaii and, and the one here. All right, plenty on the meaning, formal analysis, it's a compound, and it's weighted, in this case, I definitely have to say unbalanced toward the right, because this is the three-story pagoda, and here's just another two-story. The one in the middle is the largest mass, right, the, the main pagoda in the center. Even though it's only two levels, it's so you know, much wider than the others. And, of course, you also have the rhythm, very powerful rhythm, of these roof lines. Let's go up and take a look at what's on the edges of the roofs. Uh, ceramic figures of dragons and birds. Isn't that interesting? So that creates rhythm. The uh, sloping, you know, eaves or roof lines projecting, of course, eaves as well as the brackets. And those are all real materials. What you have here, though, are three materials that you don't always see in a wooden pagoda. Uh, and they're all real textures, too, which are real smooth, of course, tile. There's your greenish blue tile again. Real rough wood. And then plaster, painted white plaster. This looks like Tudor English, you know, like Shakespeare's house or something. It's exactly the same construction method. And how that happened, you know, halfway around the world by two cultures 500 years ago that never had any contact. Nobody from, uh, from England was going to Japan in the, you know, 1500s. But it is the same technique, exactly. Half timbering, if you want to know the word, but you don't need to write that. That's a, an a English term for the wooden homes with the beams, you know, showing on the walls and the plaster. So again, to uh, summarize that about textures, there are only real textures, smooth, real tile rough real wood and again it would be smooth real plaster on the walls and then the colors are of course cool on the tile and cool on the plaster and warm on all the woodwork right and there is modeling from the overhanging eaves as well as the the walls that creates the natural shadows from the sun here there is visual line that's more obvious because of the beaming but you can't see carved line here, but there is some carved into the ceramic. Uh, if you want to write that, you can, but it's hard to see in this photo. So you wouldn't have to mention that if it's on the final. But there is some carved line on the roof lines. And the rest of the line on the walls are all um, <clears throat> visual. And then we have uh, the rhythm. I think I mentioned, oh yeah, uh, it is stable on the outer walls and dynamic on the roof lines. And each building is individually balanced, but like I said, the overall compound, at least this part you can see in the picture, isn't balanced uh, only because this is a taller structure, so it's unbalanced uh, to the right. And for space, you've got a three-story and two two-story pagodas, but the height of this is about 50 feet. But the main room that, that, that is on the up, upstairs floor is, is much taller, so you're looking at about a 30-foot high ceiling in the room with the statue of Buddha on the upper level. That's the largest space in the compound. I got to walk all around and you know, I was gonna to talk to the monks, but there were lines of people waiting to ask them questions. It was more crowded than this 
here, this scene. <clears throat> I think it was thousands of tourists there. And there was probably some holiday I wasn't aware of, Buddhist maybe holiday. Anyway, the point is I got to walk up and down the stairs and I can tell you that room is the largest space in the whole compound. It's the upstairs floor of the uh, Central Pagoda has a roughly 30 foot high ceiling and a single wide room. And then the downstairs is about 20 feet high. That's all you have to, and the total height to the bottom of the foundation to the peak of the gable is about 50 feet. Okay, let's move on to how are we doing on time? We're doing quite well, actually. Uh, I am gonna cut one of these slides, but let me see, did, did, I just wanna make sure here. Um, now, we'll, we'll, when we get toward the end, I'll do that. This is not a must know. I just wanted you to see another example of a Shinto Buddhist temple. You only have to know where it is because I'm not sure. It's a new slide I found on the internet, but it just had such nice detail. You can see here, there's that plaster and wood beaming like the English Tudor houses have, but also obviously the Japanese pagodas from the Middle Ages. So it's about that age, about a thousand or so AD. And then there's gold here on these two odd looking uh, finials, right? One on e either end. Uh, and then all that woodwork is or very ornate, but it's typical of Shinto Buddhist uh, structures uh, from the mid or yeah, mid medieval period or the golden age, some would call it, or the high point of Shinto Buddhism in Japan. It's still practiced there, but it's become a much smaller percentage. As someone told me there's like seven or eight million out of 130 million people that are still, uh, but maybe bigger than that by now. But it, it definitely isn't where it was before in the Middle Ages. It was, well, it's hard to say a majority, but the largest single subgroup of Buddhists in Japan for a long time around the Middle, mid, middle Ages, around 1,000, 1,200, were Shinto Buddhists. But there were several kinds of Shinto Buddhists too, though. <laughs> you don't have to know that. Okay, this is the next muscle. We have two more muscle. So we are going to end early tonight. Uh, I'll cut one of the last three, but not this one. This is night attack. Just like the words sound. Night attack on Sanjo Palace. S-A-N-J-O Palace. P-A-L-A-C-E, of course, right? And then we have Japan, obviously. And the date's 1275. Okay, this is really interesting when you know what you're looking at. This is an illustration that is... Uh, an example of the warlord era. Um, they were called shogun, the word in Japanese. Some of you may know there was a, now why would you know that? There was a TV series in the 80s, or early 90s, real popular with all these hard throb actors. I know my wife was <laughs> really into it. Uh, you wouldn't know who they were. Anyway, they were big names in the 80s and 90s called shogun. It lasted several seasons. It was based on novels about this period by an American Christian writer, I think. But the point is, this is what you should be writing, starting with the first fact about the meaning of this. It illustrates, like the title says, a battle. You know, one warlord's army, well, they were mercenaries, of course, so you should probably just write that, that his mercenary army, you know, hired, paid warriors for a warlord, are attacking and taking over a rival warlord's compound or it's some people call it a castle, but you can see it's more than one building. Obviously, once you get that, two or more buildings, especially when you got, what, at least three here, one, two, three that are visible, this is a compound, uh, but it's not religious at all. This would be, uh, you know, some warlord's private compound where he and his family lived, his, you know, various staff, and of course, he probably kept his soldiers there. So he, the guy that owns the you know, San Joe Palace is the title called this location, this warlord's compound. They're losing the battle. That should be obvious. But if it isn't, get up close and you can see what's happening. Uh, the attackers are obviously routing the defenders here, pushing them back. And uh, the point is that this is a documented event, so we know what happened. The attackers that are depicted here as, you know, on the run, on the, on the run, sorry, as making the defenders right, retreat that are, you know, literally uh, aggressive and f running at or attacking the defenders. Mercilessly, they won that battle. Not only did they defeat that warlord, but of course, guess what happened? He was executed and his soldiers, most of them were, were killed. So it was a big 
battle, an important one, between two of the most powerful warlords in Japan. That period was a very tough time for the average person in Japan. I've had friends who are from Japan, former students and teachers I've known over the years who, who talk about in their history books, they talk about this period as a very sad uh, period of Japanese history for most people. Maybe if you were one of the winning warlords, it wasn't, but for almost everybody else, for even the soldiers who worked for those warlords, because of course they risked their lives and quite often gave them up in service of a very self-centered, right, self-serving system of uh, independent warlords. So Japan during that period, we call the late Middle Ages, because this would be late medieval now, was, uh, well, racked by warfare, you could say, or, um, you know, at the mercy of warlords. And therefore, there was a lot of political turmoil and economic hardship for the average citizen. That's, in a way, this was what it symbolizes. But the other last fact about the meaning is look at how the fire is depicted. Isn't that fascinating? If you get far enough away, <clears throat> or certainly if you just glance at it or squint, it kind of looks like real flames and smoke coming up out of the burning buildings, right? But when you get really up close, you see what the technique is here. After all, this is during the Middle Ages. This is, to my mind, superior quality painting to what you'll see when we uh, finish up with medieval. Well, we aren't. We're not going to do that, are we? Uh, yeah, yeah, we are. We are. That's right. We're going to go all the way through late Gothic period. So almost, but not quite to the Renaissance. So you'll see what I'm talking about. Medieval European paintings, rarely, only a few painters were able to depict reality very much you know, like this or any better than this. Um, and yet the technique is stylized. There's no other word for it. I mean, flames don't look like that when you get up close, but it's so well done that at a distance, this technique, these painters is not the only one that used that technique, could uh, imitate, or you could say mimic the uh, appearance or effect of uh, flames. Uh, with with you know uh, very stylized techniques, not realistic, and yet once you look at it as a whole at a distance, however you want to say that, you know, just looking at the whole scene, it does appear to be realistic images of uh, flames, of, of fire and smoke, of course. And then the soldiers, there's no question, they're well done, and the horses they're riding in on you and the horse you rode in on, you know. <laughs> Uh, these these are really professional soldiers who, of course, were paid more, you know, for how many people they killed or whatever, how many compounds they assaulted and, and, and took over. So their motivation is money. Of course, they're all paid mercenaries. All right. That's the whole meaning. Uh, oh, one last thing. It does have an oblique angle. Almost all Japanese, right, prints. But this far back, it's a little ahead of its time. From the last 500 years, Japanese prints of whatever the scene is, landscaping, uh, group portrait, a historic scene, uh, you know, or like, uh, you know, some, some of the later prints you've heard of Hokusai, right? The Great Wave, you may have seen that one where the giant wave is swamping boats in the harbor uh, in front of uh, Mount Fuji. Some of you know that print. Um, anyway, the point is later on, it became the technique for all Japanese prints, but this guy was ahead of his time. We don't know the name of the artist, uh, at least I've never seen it. Uh, but the point is it's that sharp diagonal is the word. So that's the last fact here, and then we'll segue into the formal analysis that you should put in your notes on the meaning. It, it is an early example, there we go, one of the earliest examples of a Japanese print technique. This actually is a painting. It's not a print. They don't have prints this far back. So you can say painting and print technique of the oblique angle. They love that in Japanese art. It became the almost required perspective for almost all Japanese artwork after about 1700 or so, so the last 300 years. But it was even being used earlier, obviously. Here we go. It's not even what, 700 years or almost 800 years ago. And it's that diagonal perspective that isn't what most Western artists, none of them, in fact, knew this you know, perspective or would ever have used it until the 1800s when they imitated Japanese art because of their connections and contacts with Japanese culture after about 1850, right? So when you get to um, the later periods, if you take art 2.2 or 2.3, you get impressionist painters and Van Gogh specifically loved this technique of the oblique angle, but Western artists weren't using it. So this is very specific to Japanese painting and prints from the uh, mid-medieval period here, or late, actually, it's late medieval. 
you see what I mean? This is all, everything's at a diagonal, you know, the buildings and the perspective overall. Okay, let's do a formal analysis and end with the last must know. I'll cut one of the last two and I'll say which in just a moment. Uh, this is balanced, or is it? Because if the flames have mass, then it's unbalanced, of course, it's up to you to decide towards the uh, right. But if you count that as pretty much empty space, and then you have this building here and this building here and the hordes of soldiers in the middle, I'd say it's roughly balanced. Or you could think of these two horsemen balanced out with, uh, with uh, you know, most of the smoke area of the flames. But it's up to you to say how you see it. Uh, I do think it's unbalanced though toward the bottom because there is empty space clearly more above the, the uh, midline. The rhythm is powerful. The repeated shapes of the soldiers, the horses, the flames, stylized though they are, and the buildings. There is modeling in this. A lot of Japanese prints have very little modeling or none in the flames where the smoke is and on the roofs of the buildings. There's modeling. There definitely is. And there's simulated texture, but is it realistic? You decide. On the flames, I just describe how I don't think that's realistic, really, but it does create the illusion of flames and smoke. So that is a kind of similar texture. And on all the human and animal figures, the horses, right, the soldiers, their armor, that's all really well done realistic similar textures. And then we have the rhythm, of course, of repeated shapes of the buildings and the flames and the soldiers and their horses. It's all dynamic. I mean, because even the buildings with the straight, you know, corners still the walls are all diagonal because of this oblique angle so i don't think any part of this is, is stable really none of the human figures and horses are they're all in motion and all you know at uh, diagonal or curved lines so there's really nothing stable i don't think unless you might want to count the corner of this building lines here thin outlines on the uh, animals and the human figures and at the edges of this compound but i'd say this is bold outline here Depends on how you look at it. And line is really what the fires are made out of. And that's definitely not, it's not outlined, but it is a kind of bold line. And of course, for color, to finish up on the formal analysis here, you've got mostly warm colors in the upper half, or particularly the upper right where the flames are, and a mixture of mostly cool gray and off-white, but some scattered reds or warm colors on the clothing of the, and armor of the uh, soldiers but most of the, the horses and human figures in all of this section of the compound and even both ends of the compound uh, are cool colors. Well, the black roof lines are neutral, obviously. And one horse, this horse. So How big is this piece? Um, good question. Let me see, because I don't have that uh, memorized. Uh, I think she might have described it. Yeah, I'd like to know too, because it's one of my favorite works. Um, hmm. they may not it, see she it's like a lot of textbooks they go in and out of some examples are used you know uh, in one edition and not the other so this one doesn't have it I, I I remember reading about it but it's been a couple of years so I would get it's it's several feet long I know it's not a miniature. They did do miniature things, but it's meant to be displayed on the wall, probably of the victorious, you know, warlord, right after he won that battle and took over the enemy's uh, compound. Uh, it's probably just say, you know, somewhere between six and 10 feet wide. That, that, I'm sure it's in that range. You don't have to know that, for example. Okay, let's move on to the last must know, but I'll go ahead and tell you the one that we're gonna cut is this one. I love it, but I did promise to end early, but I'll go ahead and tell you what it is. And it, now this is in the most recent editions, several, the latest, I think three or four of the latest editions of Stockstead. She's kept it in um, most of her recent editions. Well, she passed away, maybe you know that three or four years ago. So the publisher has kept it. Monk Sewing, Cow Ninja 1300. So because I want, to, I promise to cut one, even though we have time to cover it, and I like it a lot, I'll just tell you what this symbolizes. You can cross it off. Okay, it's the last slide on the list at the bottom of the section of Japanese art. Just cross it off so you don't have to worry about studying it or even taking notes, but just so you know what you're looking at before we wrap up with the, and then if you could stick around for one to two minutes after the last slide, 
I will um, do the full screen again after stop share, right? And, and hold up that chart for those who might want to be more clear about how you can still get an A if you're not yet earning an A or, or your grades aren't quite as high as you were hoping they were at this point. Okay, and that'll be the last thing I do before just saying, okay, then any questions and that's when you guys obviously can take off. <laughs> All right, so what is it? It's an example of those retreats we've been talking about. It's a Buddhist monk who is making his own clothes. And it's a beautiful example of a scroll painting hanging from, you know, uh, the ceiling right, or the upper wall at the top of a wall. And this one would easily be eight feet. Some of these are 12. I've seen these in China, I've been to Japan, but I went to several people's homes and then I went to one gift shop where they had th this kind of decorative detail that it was just, uh, or a, a object, I should say, scroll painting they're called. And then normally anywhere from, well, the shortest ones were like six feet, maybe five, some of them. Most of them were eight to 10 feet. And a few were even 12 feet, depending on the height of the ceiling in the building they were made for. So this is probably made for a room with about an eight foot high ceiling. You have to know this uh, since it's now been taken off the syllabus. But I just like it a lot because you see the artist is emphasizing what the guy's doing. Oh, I guess it isn't going to go larger, huh? thought it would. Hmm. Maybe it just doesn't want to. Yeah, what you see here uh, is is you know moss from a hanging you know moss from a tree and the tree trunk, and then here he is with his look at his concentrated expression here. Whoops, I didn't want to, I need to do that. Yeah, yeah, it just isn't going to go larger. I'm not sure why. Maybe because it's the last slide. Um, anyway, so you see the detail he focused the artist focused on that he that he wants us to see is the. Uh, you know, natural surrounding, which he's sitting under a tree, probably, you know, for the shade, you know, and the cool uh, setting outdoors somewhere. And he lives in one of those religious compounds we've been talking about, you know, the Buddhist uh, retreats. And he's required to make his own clothes. Look, he's even barefoot here. And uh, he's rather, in rather intensely concentrating, of course, on his work. And it it's meant to be slightly whimsical and humorous. I like this piece a lot, but it isn't going to be on the exam. And uh, you could just, you know, appreciate it for a moment. Let's now go back to a very important slide. This one has a, a, one of the higher probabilities of this whole night's lecture of any one slide of being on the final. So make sure you take good notes. This is Kuya towards preaching. The name of the Buddhist monk is Kuya, K-U-Y-A, preaching. Kosho, we know the artist's last name, K-O-S-H-O, -S Kosho. And the date, you could ignore the little C again, circa uh, just 1200. So again, we have just the rough approximate date. Why is this so important? Well, here we have a pure land, that's your last definition, right? Buddhist monk, <clears throat> a form of Shinto Buddhism. Here we go. I'm going to give you the definition and say it slowly, of course, and repeat it once. Your, your definition is your third one for tonight, right? Shinto, sorry, I meant pure flat Buddhism, right? It's like it sounds, is a form of Shinto Buddhism which taught that there is a better place or pure land which taught that there is a better place or pure land to which worshipers could go after they died, if they followed the teachings of Buddha. He didn't teach that. You know that, right? We covered that enough. That, that That's not what he was saying. He was talking about enlightenment. That's different than life after death, right? So they had no contact with Christianity. None, zero, zip. At this point in Japan, I don't think they even knew what a Christian was. Uh, and so it's just ironic in a way that these two, you know, major world religions developed at least some of their subcategories, subgroups, like this form of Shinto Buddhism. I'll repeat that again. Pure Land Buddhism was a form of Shinto Buddhism, uh, which taught that there is a better place or a quote unquote pure land to which worshippers could go after they died if they followed the teachings of Buddha. So that's what this guy's doing. He is going from village to village. It was a real person. This is a portrait from life, probably from sketches, but maybe from actual life 
as in an artist sitting next to the guy when doing his portrait. All we know is that he he was a famous preacher who traveled all over this. I don't think he could have traveled the whole, uh, Japan's a pretty big place, right? Like the state of California, it's a lot of territory. On foot, as Buddha himself did, just say he traveled over many sections of Japan throughout his adult life as a preacher, going from village to village and preaching this version of Buddhism. And the evidence is really strong on this figure. He's about two feet high. First of all, he's standing on a book of Buddhist prayers. So I mean, you know that. I think it's even called the book of prayers. Well, actually, that's the word for several religions that have early written evidence of what they were teaching. So you get to say a Buddhist book of prayers is, is the base. Then we have his simple attire. Yeah, this one we can get up close. Yeah. And that would be, you know, homespun cloth. He made his own clothes once again, as most Buddhist monks would be expected to. Then he's carrying a uh, drum, which he beats with this hammer. And it's really more of a gong. I would call it a gong because a drum to me means it's got, a, you know, a pigskin or something across it and it, it's hollow. But this is a gong, a metal. You can say a metal drum if you prefer, in which he would beat this repeatedly until he gathered a crowd to come listen to him preach about this concept of Pure Land Buddhism. Then he's carrying a walking stick or cane. It's not really a cane, so a better word is a walking stick because he's not leaning on it, uh, which ends with an, a set of antlers, right, from a deer. And that's symbolic of the fact, some of you know this, that before Buddha even decided to leave his home, when he was being raised in that palace where he grew up, he went hunting like he would have been inspected as a son of a powerful man, probably with his father and brothers. And one day he shot a deer, you know, with a bow and arrow, obviously, and he regretted it. And that may or may not have been one of those turning points. You know, it was probably when he was in his you know, early 20s, as a young married man, a young father. And he hated to, you know, felt terrible watching the deer die. And so that story was being told about Buddha for well over a thousand years by the time this branch of Buddhism came along. So it was a well-known anecdote, you could say, right, or story about the life of Buddha. And so it's symbolic of the fact that he, this preacher, wants people to follow that, you know, do no harm to any living creature unless, you, you know, it, it's essential for your survival, you know. Uh, to defend yourself or for, perhaps for food if you have no other choice but don't harm animals or other living beings if you can avoid it so that's what that walking stick is symbolic of but my favorite detail is what's coming out of his mouth those six figures are miniature buddhas and they symbolize a chant, which I'm going to do maybe once or twice, so you don't have to listen to it too much. But if you don't know about this, you can check it out. It's still around. In this country, it became popular in the 70s when I was a student at Berkeley. It's called Nishin Shoshu Buddhism. Some of you may have heard of it. You can look it up. I think it's still around. And it's a very American version of this same concept, which is if you chant loudly and long enough, over and over in a room full of other people. I've done that in a room of 5,000 people at Santa Monica Civic Auditorium in Santa Monica, California, when I was like a sophomore at Berkeley, because I was interested in Buddhism and I was just trying to discover what it was like. It gives you a natural high, I'll tell you that, to do that for an hour nonstop. It's partly just because you're almost forced to hyperventilate. But he was doing it to gra gather crowds. He would say that same chant that now we know is well, well over a thousand years old, right? But at least it goes back that far. A Buddhist chant, which Buddha himself didn't. He didn't have to. His reputation preceded him. When he went to a village, people gathered to hear him because they all, word of mouth, they heard, hey, Buddha's coming. But this guy needed to get people's attention. And that's one of the ways two ways. He banged the gong. <laughs> it's actually a song, isn't it? Yeah. From the 80s. Yeah. And then we have the uh, chanting, the Buddhist chant. You don't How is he not revered as a kook? Uh, <laughs> well, there, he was one of hundreds of such uh, priests that went around 
uh, teaching that there was this pure land. And this is the period of the warlords. I'm sorry, I forgot to add that fact. It's an important background fact about the meaning of this, because I just told you how much suffering that caused among the normal population or the majority of Japanese civilians and why. So if you can imagine that context, and then someone tells you, you can go to a better place. Well, that's what the medieval followers of Christianity told themselves, because not all of them, but the ones that suffered, like most people, peasants, farmers, even, you know, small town merchants, didn't have a very good life in the Middle Ages, right? I mean, compared to supposedly right today. And of course, they latched on to the teaching of uh, heaven and a better life after this, you know, and all that, because it gave them some purpose, some hope for, you know, something better than this life. So he, he was able along with, he's not the only one, but he's one of the most famous, if not the most famous Pure Land Buddhist monks and perhaps the most influential or popular. That's why there's a sculpture of him in many museums throughout Japan, not just the one that owns this. It's from a museum collection in Japan. So yeah, you can call him whatever you want, you know, religious fanatic or something, but he didn't, he didn't harm anybody, right? He wasn't teaching that, you know, one group is better than another. That's at least mostly what Buddha was trying to get across. And of course, at least here, it's a matter of you may or may not choose to believe this, but here's how you might want to get to a better place if you're not happy with this life. The only problem with that is that Buddha himself would have disputed that. <laughs> he would have said, wait a minute, I'm not telling people that there's some kind of mythical place, call it what you want, heaven, pure land, you know, an afterlife. I'm teaching people there's a state of mind Right, we covered that, I think, uh, which you can achieve as you leave this life if you become enlightened before you die. So it, you could call it a corruption. Some people would use the word bastardization. I don't somewhat of a corruption of the Buddha's original teaching, but uh, it, it resonated with a large percentage. And this is probably the high point of Shinto Buddhism in, uh, in Japan. Okay, that's the whole meaning. Let's do a formal analysis and then I'll, sh uh, I'll hold up that chart I have that you can just take a screenshot if you want and, and ask any questions uh, as we get ready to finish up. So he is about two feet tall. Not quite, it's more like 20 inches or something. It's between 18 inches and two feet. So just say a little less than two feet, the figure here, <clears throat> including the base is probably about that two feet. Uh, so it's real space, but with overlapping, of course, of the clothing over his body. And then we have the cement textures, superb. These are really finely done. This burlap cloth he's wearing that he made himself his own robe out of. And the metal gong and the antlers. These are both the real antlers from an actual deceased deer. And his skin, all oh, really well done. Uh, so we have all cement textures done with carve line, of course. And it is uh, warm on the metal sections. You know, this is discoloration, but on the... Uh, gong and on the book of prayers as the base, but the rest of it is neutral, black. It's, it's carved wood, by the way. Uh, and then we have the rhythm, of course, is human body, two arms, two legs, two hands, two feet. And then the rhythm of the Buddhas, the chanting <laughs> symbol here. I love that, how they're coming out of his mouth as he speaks. Uh, so there's so much rhythm and it's mostly stable. He's upright and he's facing straight forward. His walking stick is, is until you get to the very tip top, part of it, I mean, uh, and the base. But there are dynamic details, obviously, the gong and the top of his head and the top of his walking stick. Uh, and then we have um, no technique for modeling. Uh, the masses, well, you decide, but certainly he's the largest mass and probably the base and then the walking stick, okay? And uh, it's balanced as a human figure would be, but you might think because the base is wider, it feels unbalanced toward the bottom, but certainly balanced left to right. But I would say balanced also uh, top to bottom, at least within his body. Uh, and I'm forgetting anything. I think that's it for space. Yeah, I think we've covered just about everything. Okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to uh, take literally less than, okay, um, 60 seconds, if not less, to hold this up for you. And this is a hypothetical that you can plug in your own figures if you want to do so, to give you a concrete, numerical, absolutely verifiable uh, set of figures or equation, if you want to call it that, that proves you could still get an A even if you didn't do well. You know, you got a C or a D on the test or the, the uh, first paper. Let's say you only got a C on the first paper. Very few people got less than that, but you can plug your own numbers in if you, if you want to do this exercise. 
<clears throat> and then in the midterm, yeah, if some people didn't pass it. Well, that's barely passing. It's like a D, right? 65. And then what? How can you uh, uh, pull up from that to, to an A? You can easily. You have two uh, components that will help you raise your grade. One, obviously, is extra credit. No one here has come close to maxing out. You can get up to 50 points and you still have about six. No, actually, you have seven weeks. I allow extra credit up through the end of final exams week. You're going to get another email, one more this probably weekend and one last one before the final, uh, reminding you of your options. Or you can email me at any time. So you can get up to 50 points that way. Now, in your second paper, I'm just going to say this. There's no excuse for not getting at least a 90 point. If you didn't do as well as that on your first, it's because you forgot a few things. And you know what those are. Right when you got your your paper back, or if you have questions, you can check with me. So you ought to be able to get at least like an A minus. Now, where does that leave you right before heading into the final? Well, there's your subtotal, 280. That would be a C. That'd be a passing grade. Most people want to aim higher than that. So what do you have to do to get an A? You have to get a B minus, 80 points. And since it's an open book test, you should be able to do that if you if you take good notes and you prepare and you have that three-day window after I give the test in real time to go back and check your answers. And that would add up to 360 points, which is an A. To get a B, you don't have to get 40 points if you had these totals heading into the final. And nobody here is not going to do better than that. So you see my point. I'm just trying to give you encouragement and uh, concrete evidence that you, you can pull up from, you know, a bad test day or somehow maybe you just didn't focus enough and uh, take enough time on your first paper. Speaking of which, I've sent an email. I'm not going to do this anymore verbally because this goes out to, you know, it's on public, right, access <laughs> uh, from uh, the, you know, the whole set of lectures on uh, YouTube. Uh, so I think it's a little less private than it is to send an email just to people in class. But I did this for both my classes. I just told people if I knew for a fact that they were missing either the midterm, that one you can only make up if you have written evidence that you were physically unable to take it, such as a, uh, either a family or health emergency, any kind of written evidence, then, then you're allowed to do some makeup assignment. But I have to be able to confirm that. Uh, but But the papers, that that you still have the right to do right up until before the final. If you didn't do your first paper, I would do it right away <laughs> and get that because I still have a few people. I sent them email or sent emails that mention who they are that I'm aware of, uh, which it could be a few students who just dropped out and didn't uh, remove them. So I don't drop people after the uh, first sentence. I have a question. Now, time for questions. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, are we having a feedback on our papers? Because when I try to open it, it says that I need not uh, like an access. You got what? Sorry, say it again. Uh, feedback on our papers. Because yes. when, when you send the, the email with the um, rate and I try to open it and it says that I need um, code access or something like that. Uh oh, no, that's a, a glitch that isn't of my making. So I'm not sure why that happened. Well, if you want to email me again, uh, okay. There are two alternatives. One is I can summarize in, you know, not just one or two words, but a couple sentences, the exact scores you got on each section or what you missed. I can do that. That'll give you a concrete idea of how I, well you did and why you got that grade. Or I can try and figure out what the problem was, but I'm not very, uh, usually I'm not very successful at figuring out why that's happened. I've had maybe one or two students this semester say something similar. So you're yeah. saying that I sent you back something that would have looked like it had your grade and you couldn't open it. Is that right? No, you sent the grade, but I was wondering if you if you write down a feedback on the paper. Oh, if I graded it, uh, my, I don't know why I can't do editing on the actual test, whereas oh. my readers can. I still can summarize, though. I'm saying if you want to, send me another email. Oh, Remind okay. me of that. And what I'll do is go back and take a look at the actual marks you got and summarize you know, enough for you to know how you did and what, what you missed. Okay. okay? Yeah, Perfect. of course, I, I'm happy to do that. And I have time to do that anytime. But uh, if you want to do it, you know, tonight or tomorrow, I can get it back to you for the weekend. Okay. Any other questions? Because, you know, that's what we're here for. Uh, uh, anything about grades, extra credit, um, or, oh, yeah. or your papers? Remember, they're due next Thursday. Uh, so th I said Thursday. Wednesday before midnight, but if you can get them before class, it's even better. Get off your plate. Yes, one more question. I thought I heard. Uh, yeah, I actually have a question. 
talking about the paper. So the piece I want to do is actually has a bit of history. Um, I wanted to keep it a surprise, but uh, the piece I want to do is the concept art for the recent Godzilla design in oh. the show they're doing. Huh. So, oh, I'm interested uh, to see what you come up with. Uh, that's so, fine. As long yeah, as no, it's but, an actual image, you're going to be able to show me oh. as the illustration, right? A still yeah, yeah, or a poster or what? A, a it's basically a uh, really concept art that uh, that one the oh. designer did. However, my question is this: uh, should, I, should I do uh, two artists technically? Because the artist for the original designer of the OG uh, design from like the 1954 film, and then with that, and as well as uh, it's so up to you. Like, you could either just no. do one in great in a fair amount of detail, like you know, cover all the elements of composition on either one. But I can't remember. I think it was color. You know, I was a tiny kid when that movie came out, and I uh, the original I wasn't even old enough to go see it. But I did see it in a theater with my dad sometime in grade school years. Oh later. yeah, the uh, original Godzilla was. Uh, is completely black and white still wasn't today. it yeah that's what i thought yeah yeah i would go i would go with color the more was recent not a thing image. i think you have more to work with with the more recent images but that's your decision because you yeah. can write about a black and white work of art whether it's a photo a movie a, a painting a, an engraving but but i think it gives you more material to work with and maybe, yeah but yes go ahead but well, yeah th the thing is like i wonder should i also mention and both the artist of this new design, but also the artist for the the original one, which is what is the basis to all designs of the monster. You should mention right. that if you write about the new piece, do the formal analysis on that. But in the meaning, of course, is where you'd bring up the original design and any right. Design. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah, that would work. Right. I can give you one Perfect. other example. May inspire you, may not. I'm one of the best papers I've ever read. Not only was it 100, but if I could have given it 120 points, I would have maximum score, A plus, was on the cover of the Beatles' Sgt. Pepper's album. I didn't know this, and I grew up with that album, right? And it's a fascinating story of how those figures were 70 or 80 people are shown on the cover of that. If you don't know the album, you can look it up. It's one of the most famous images in the history of rock and roll, of course. And uh, it got, you know, kudos for the design. And how did that happen? It was very complex. It wasn't just one person who created that. And the Beatles had a major hand in, but they weren't the only creative uh, source for that. And that paper was, you know, even more complex, I think, than what you're going to try to do. But it was so much fun that the guy really, you know, of course, earned his A. So, I'm sure you can do that well. Okay, any other questions about anything else, grades or otherwise? All right, I think we've had a full night. So thank you all, whoever's left, I can't tell, right? A few, <laughs> okay, good night, take care. <laughs> Anybody still out there? <laughs> good night. <laughs> all right. <laughs>